Hey guys, so this is the tutorial that I wish I had when I was starting out my bubble journey. What we're gonna be doing today is building a marketplace app from scratch in a way that just teaches you the fundamentals of bubble. So this is really geared towards people who are completely new to bubble, non-technical people. Maybe you've got an app idea that you wanna get off the ground. That's how I started. That's how many people in this community started. So that's what we're gonna focus on today. So if you wanna jump straight into building, jump to the next chapter, you can find the timestamp in the description. Otherwise, I just want to have a quick word on sort of bubble in general and the right mindset that you should have going in to bubble. So Bubble, of course, as you know already, is a visual programming language. What that really means ultimately is that it's giving you this visual interface, which is manipulating the code base, so to speak, of your app underneath. So in the same way as you're familiar with a program like Photoshop, right, where you're using a visual interface with your mouse to sort of change the look and feel of an image. What's actually happening there underneath is that there is code that's being manipulated every time that you're making changes in Photoshop. The, the code of the image file itself is being manipulated. And you could, of course, just go straight into that image file and just change the code, right? Just change a few letters here and there. But that's going to be a really tedious and non-intuitive way of editing a photo. So Photoshop gives you this layer of abstraction above that. And Bubble is exactly the same thing just for web applications. So giving you this layer of, ab of abstraction that's way more intuitive for people, especially non-technical people, to interact with. But in saying that, what Bubble still forces you to do is program. So I want to talk a little bit about the distinction between coding and programming, because even though, yeah, you're not writing lines of code, right? That syntax based code that we're all familiar with. Even though you're not coding, what you are doing is programming. Whether you're writing code in JavaScript or you're bubbling, you're still programming. And what I mean by programming is that you're giving commands to a machine, right? You're writing a program that is gonna tell a machine, in this case, your bubble application, what to do. So the bubble application rather is the program and it's running on a machine or rather multiple machines. And what you have to do is tell it exactly what to do, okay? You can't take anything for granted. You can't assume that the application is just gonna do something in a particular way because you find that intuitive. And just to show you what I mean for a second, I've got this button here on a page that I created, okay? All that's gonna happen is it's gonna create an object, create an object in my database. And we'll of course talk about databases in, in just a little bit. So I'm gonna click this button, all right? And we'll create the object. Well, I just clicked the button and it doesn't really look like anything happened. But of course it did. There, there was an object that was just created. It's just that as the user of this site, just doesn't seem like anything was created. Like you'd expect that you'd see some kind of indicator, right? The button would change color or there'd be an alert or something, but that kind of stuff wasn't programmed. So if we just jump into the bubble editor for a second, I can show you, here's the command. Right, this is what Bubble would call a workflow and we'll get into all the details of how this works. But I basically got a command here that says, when this button is clicked, okay, create a new object. But I don't have any other commands after that. I'm not saying show an alert to the user or change the color of the button or anything that would give the user a visual cue that there has in fact just been an object created. So that's what I mean by don't take anything for granted. Every little step, every little bit of behavior that you want your application to follow, more or less, there is some built-in kind of commands around users, but more or less, um, you have to create everything. So just getting into that programming mindset is really the most important thing when you're starting out uh, bubbling. Because yeah, even though you're not writing code, okay, you should still think of yourself as a developer. It doesn't really matter what tool you're using, whether it's Python or JavaScript, or whether you're writing some code in something like an SQL database, if you're familiar with those, or whether you're using Bubble, ultimately what you are doing across all of those tools is using them to write programs. And that means thinking in a very logical, analytical way about what you want your application to actually do. So with that little preamble out of the way, let's actually jump into editing and creating our first app. All right, so when you first log into your 
bubble account, okay, you're gonna see this page. You may have already dabbled and you may already know about this. So what we wanna do is create a new application now from scratch. So we click the new app button and now we're gonna sort of call this something. So I'm gonna call this um, the Mega Tutorial 2022, let's say. And here is just basically some forms that Bubble wants you to fill out to give some information to them about what you're building for their own analytics. So in our case, I'm just gonna skim through all of this. It is not important for our purposes. All right, and now our Bubble app opens for the first place. And what Bubble does is it gives you this sort of template um, right out of the box if you want. We don't want that. So we're gonna click start with a blank page. And then we're gonna close this assistant. So this is the bubble editor, okay? So what you're seeing here is the canvas, the design canvas, where you actually will place the elements that will appear to your users in your website. But you have other columns here on the left-hand side too, the workflow tab and the data tab and, and some of these other tabs as well, which we're gonna go into. For now, we're just gonna focus on the design tab. So basically what, we're, what we've got here on up on the left-hand corner is, this is telling us that the current page of the application that we're editing is the index page. And actually, I can actually click here and I can see some other pages here as well. So that index page is what we are currently editing. And if I was to double click on this canvas, I actually bring up what Bubble calls the element inspector. So this is basically like a properties panel that lets you change certain things about the page or the element that you are inspecting. So in this case, we're actually changing the properties for the page itself. So what I could do is I could actually come down here and change this to a flat color and then change the background color to maybe a light Great. And by the way, just quickly, um, your bubble editor might look slightly different than mine at this point. So you can see that I've got this sort of grid here. You can toggle off that kind of grid or toggle it on rather um, by just clicking up here, grids and borders. And then you can toggle to sort of show a grid and you can change the size of those grid boxes as well and change some other properties here. So I encourage you to kind of play around with that when you are editing. So there's one other little small thing that I just want to address before we kind of dig into the meat here. And that is is this responsive tab over here. So Bubble is actually right in the middle now of rolling out a new responsive engine. By responsive, all I'm talking about is the behavior of how your app is gonna look depending on the size of your user's screen. So how your application might kind of shrink or expand or have certain elements drop out depending on the size of the screen that your users are using. So if you're watching this when this responsive engine is out of beta, it's currently at the moment of recording in beta, then um, you won't see this option at all. But for us who are watching this sort of at this moment while the responsive engine, the new responsive engine is still in beta, we just need to come over to this responsive tab and click upgrade responsive. If you've made some changes, you might see this kind of thing, but if you haven't made any changes, then you won't say it at all. We don't need to copy this. So we're just gonna upgrade that page. And so this kind of upgrade is done on a page by page basis. But as I said, if you're watching this a few months from now when the responsive engine is out of beta, then you won't see that option to upgrade. You'll just be on the new responsive engine by default. And um, you do want to do this for every page. You do want to be using this new responsive engine because it is vastly superior to what was there before. In saying that, I don't want us to actually deal with responsiveness at all today because it's sort of a, another topic on its own. I want us to just sort of deal with the fundamental building blocks of programming in Bubble today. So what I actually want us to do is if we open up that element inspector again for our index page and we go over to this layout tab, okay, I just want to make sure that your container layout is set to be fixed. And what that means is that it doesn't matter what size screen your users are viewing your application on, it will always stay the same size. It won't shrink or expand or have any other kind of responsive behavior. So right out of the gate, okay, let's just actually see what our application looks like. We've given it this kind of background color. What we can do is come over to this preview button over here, click preview, and that will open in a new tab our application as it appears to our users. So you can see here that we actually do have a fixed width page, you know, like this is the, the size of our canvas. I'll just jump out of full screen mode here for you. 
um, you can see that, you know, this is the size of our canvas here. Technically, it's 1080 pixels wide, and this is 1080 pixels wide. So my laptop screen is a little bit wider than that, which is why you're seeing the sort of white space on either side. So this is good. This is what we actually want right now. This is not how you would build applications in practice. You would always want them to be responsive, but let's leave responsiveness for now, or now we'll deal with that in a separate video. So now let's actually add some elements to our page, right? Let's actually make it look like something. So over on the left hand side here, you have all of the different elements, as Bubble calls them, objects, things that you can add to a page. So the simplest one is this category, visual elements. So for example, I could just drag, drag a text box on here. We all know what text does. So what I wanna do here is in this box up here, I'm actually gonna define what this text actually says. So let's go with you know the old programming convention and um, you know I can change the size of this box right here. I can also do some other things like change the style, so how this text actually looks. So, you know, Bubble comes with a whole bunch of pre-configured styles like this. Might actually have to drag it a little bit bigger. Um, but what you can also do is just click up here to not choose any style whatsoever. And then you kind of have more granular control over um, the particular text properties that you like. And you can actually create your own styles too, right? So your own um, pre-configured templates for how elements like this text should look. And we'll get into that in a little while. For now, we'll just won't choose any style at all. So I'm gonna click preview again, and that's going to reload this preview page for us. And hey, you can see, okay, this is exactly how we've defined our app. So there you go. Your app is actually out there in the world. Like if I sent you this URL right now and made sure that this application was public, you would see this as well. It is live on the interweb. So that's text, right? And you also have other kind of visual elements that you can add here. So, you know, you can add a button, you could add an image, and you can upload whatever you want to actually be displayed within that image element here, right? So I'll upload an image here, Bubble will upload that and then it will display the image. And there's sort of some properties that you can use here about the way that this image is displayed, but this will sort of do for now. So let's go back and, and preview what this looks like. So I could click, as I said, I can click this preview button or I can just come right over to that tab as it existed before and just click up on that top bar to see the new page. And see what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm more or less kind of like making a change, right? Making a small change to the, the application and then I'm pre Reviewing it to just see like, you know, did that work? And that's a really good habit to be into. Obviously right now, you know, we're only changing the appearance of text. So there's not much writing on, on changing lots of things. But when you get into actually programming some complex logic, you always want to sort of change one small thing and then test it just to see if everything still works as opposed to changing a whole bunch of things all at once and then previewing them all at once. Because then if there's a bug, if something's not working as you expected, you've got no way of knowing knowing what sort of action or change that you made in the application actually led to that bug. It could have been any of the changes that you made. It could be an interrelation of the changes that you made. So always good practice is to test as you go. Make a small change, test. Make a small change, test. Um, that's just a good sort of meta programming workflow. Okay, so those are basically like some basic visual elements. But let's think for a second here about what application we're actually trying to build. So it's a second hand goods marketplace where people can upload goods that they're selling and then get in contact with people who might want to buy that from them. Kind of similar to how Facebook Marketplace works if you ever use that. So we obviously need some way for a user to actually input the information about the products that they're selling, right? To tell our application, hey, I've got something to sell. Please display it to other people in the community. To add that kind of interactivity to our application, we want to come down to input forms, okay? Input being the operative word here because we're taking some value from a user. They are inputting that information into our application. So I'm just gonna delete these elements right here by clicking them and then clicking delete on my keyboard. And I'm just gonna add a simple input over here. Now, if I just preview the page here, just to show you how this input kind of works out of the box, right? Here's the input. So it kind of has this hover behavior. We can customize this kind of behavior as well, by the way. And then I can click into it and sort of start typing something. And you notice how that sort of initial type here, text, 
disappeared as soon as I started typing. So this type here text is what we call placeholder text. So it's text that's only going to be displayed when this input actually has nothing in it. And we can actually modify that ourselves. So we could say something like, you know, add your product name to kind of give a bit more of a specific prompt to the user. Right. So and then I could add, you know, my product name. Maybe I'm selling, you know, some Nike shoes. Right. And what I also might want to do just to make this kind of a little bit more usable is just add a text box up here, which is just a label. It's just basically a label for this for this input. OK, and I have snap to grid turned on. So I'm kind of that's how I'm able to kind of adjust this text to be fitting right here. OK, and now we could add some sort of other inputs too, right? Like other things that we have. We have like a multi line input, which is for adding like longer sections or longer paragraphs of text. We also have a drop down where you can have your user select from a predefined list of options. In our case, right, I think the next thing that we want to take is the price for this product. So I've added another input here. What I might just do is I might just copy this this label up here and use it again down here. So what I can do is I could just do the old control or command C and then V to create a duplicate. Or what I can do, and I'm using control Z by the way there to undo. You also have the undo redo buttons up the top there. What you can also do is just hold down control or command on a Mac and just drag on a particular element and that will make a copy of it. So here we might say price, right? And I might just rename this to be name. And another good habit that we wanna do at this point is actually name our inputs too, so that we can easily identify them later. So this input here is at the moment called input add your product name. It's just got to take in that from the placeholder text. So we might just want to call that input product name. So I would click up the top here to change that. And this, as I said, this is going to be really important later on when we need to actually reference these inputs when we need to find them. So I'll do the same thing here. I'll call it input price should be input product price if I'm following the same naming convention there. And the last thing that we might want to add is a, a photo, right? Allow our users to upload a photo of the thing that they're selling. So here I can use the picture uploader element and drag that down here and then I'll give it a label as well, right? Which just says photo. OK, and our users can now click this to upload an image. Following our good workflow, we should preview that and we can see, OK, here's all these things as they're appearing. Now, this price one, we might want to change a little bit because this is, of course, taking um, not necessarily text like we don't necessarily want it to say type here. We sort of want to kind of configure this in a way that's expecting, you know, a currency, a dollar input in, in this particular case. So we can actually change the content format of this input here, which is basically saying telling the input what type of value, what type of information should it expect? So we can change this from text down to an integer. And if I reload the page, then I won't actually be able to type in text here. I'll only be able to type in numbers. And that's really important because that's going to allow us later on to actually manipulate this data. OK, we can't necessarily add five dollars to a text value, but we can add five dollars to a number value. So we can do this kind of manipulation that's dependent on the type of value. But we can actually go one step further. Bubble gives us sort of an extra option here, which is called currency. And that lets us kind of have this prefix dollar sign if I reload the page here. You can see the input when it's focus is that dollar sign. Then we can add our, our value there. So it's just sort of a helpful formatting. But this is still ultimately a number value or an integer value. OK, and that's important because we can't save necessarily currency values into our database. That's sort of our next step, but we can save number values. So behind the scenes, what I'm trying to say is behind the scenes, even though this is currency, OK, this is actually just a number value. Bubble is just letting us configure this input to treat it for formatting purposes as if it was a currency. All right, so here's our sort of really basic form, right? I might add Nike shoes. I might say actually they're going to be $100, right? I might upload an image. There's my Nike shoes. But now what? Right, like our users now inputted this information and they obviously want that to be like saved to the app in some way so that it can be displayed to another user later on. So we probably need kind of a button here because if I refresh the page now, that information's lost, it's gone. So obviously there's sort of like a next step here, right? We would 
have, you know, from a user experience point of view, we're all familiar with this, I'm sure, having a button like this, and we might call this like add product. And that would then complete this form. But now we actually need a way to actually save this information, right? What is gonna happen when the user clicks this button? We need some instructions. We need to program something into our application. And this is sort of a moment where I wanna just move away from the computer for a moment and just talk a little bit about how our database works because our database is where all of this information is gonna be saved. It's essentially giving our application a memory so that it can retrieve information that's been saved there and display that or do something with that data at a later time. Right, so over here, we have our app. Here's our app right there. And in our app, we obviously have this like name input, right? So this is a name field and we also have a price field which I'm going to draw a little differently because it's it's a number we're taking a different kind of value here and then we have an image as well so these are kind of the inputs that a user can enter information into okay and now we actually need to kind of take this information and save it somewhere so that where we save the information is the database so database is commonly kind of drawn as like a big drum, a big cylinder. There is our database. And I want you to think about the database just like a big warehouse with all of these shelving units in it. So we might have like a user's shelf, right? And the only thing that's stored on that shelf is users. We might have another shelf that's just for products, right? So this whole warehouse is just full of shelving units and each shelving unit is dedicated to storing a particular thing. What comes to mind for me is if you ever watch, you know, like detective or police shows is the evidence room. And in the evidence room is all of these different shelves and this shelf might be for drugs and this one might contain weapons and this one might contain documents documents or melee weapons or, or, or something of the sort, right? So it's the same concept here basically, is that we have different shelving units and each of those shelving units stores different parcels or different boxes, okay? But all of the boxes on a particular shelving unit are for the same thing, okay? So we've got the users one and we've got the products one. So what we want to do ultimately is take this information that the user's inputting, these sort of unorganized values, right? There's this sort of one random name text value. There's another price value, right? If I just draw this, obviously our Nike shoes and this is $100. And then here, God, I do not want to have to draw a shoe right now, but here we go. Um, there's, our, there's our shoe, um, which looks more like an insect or a flying banana, but Rest assured, it is a shoe. And this is, of course, a text field. This is rather a text value. This is a number value. And this is an image value, okay, remember? So we wanna take this information and package it. In our case, we're just caring about products. So we've got this products shelf. And in our case, actually, there's nothing on this shelf at the moment. So I'll take all of this off, right? And then what we want to do is sort of take all of this information and put it inside of this package, this product package, and then store it somewhere on our products shelf, okay? So if I just blow this up a little bit, I've got sort of a larger version here, right? This is our larger version that we want to kind of put onto the shelf. This parcel, this box that it corresponds to a product that is a product in our database has compartments within it for each of these values, right? So it's got, right, the equivalent of a name field. It's got the equivalent of a price field and it's got the equivalent of an image field, right? So these individual kind of compartments or slots within the package, within the box itself. One way to think about this is like if you buy a new device, like a computer or an iPad, then in the box, right, there's usually like little compartments for all the little pieces, right? Little compartments for the wires and this kind of thing. Or if you're a board game geek like me, then, you know, you have different compartments within the board game box for all of the different pieces, right? For the cards and for the dice and for the little, you know, little pieces, everything like that, it's all in little compartments. So it's the same thing, same concept here in essence, is that for each 
object that we're creating in the database, right? We have these little compartments within it to house these different fields. And that's really convenient because then when we actually go to store this, what we'll do is we'll grab a new empty box off the shelf, right? We'll grab this empty box and we'll take the value that the user have, has inputted into those input fields and we'll store it here. So we'll go Nike shoes, $100 and our image, I'm not gonna draw it again, <laughs> but there's a, there's a, you know what I can do? I can do like a Nike tick, something like that. So that's what happens. And then we're gonna put this guy, right, onto our product shelf so that we can find it later and we can do something with it. We'll, we'll get to that part in a moment. So just making this concrete for a second, let's go back into the editor and I will actually create this new product in our database. So what we first have to do is go to this data tab and then configure the equivalent of what this box should actually look like, like what compartments should exist within a product data type or a box, right? A package to store on top of the shelf. Because we're going to define kind of the template, right? What all of these product data types should look like. What are all the compartments that should be in every single product? And then every time we need to create a new product, well, then we just grab a new empty box off the shelf, right? We grab a new empty box off the shelf and we put it onto the shelving unit. We store the values in it and then we put it in the shelving unit. We put it into the database. So let's start talking in the database lingo now. So over here, I would create my new data type, that new object, that new thing to put on the shelf. So I'm going to call that obviously a product. And now we have this thing called a product. And over here, I'm going to define the equivalent of these compartments, right? What are the fields? What are the values that should live inside of a product? So the first one, I'm just going to call name. So corresponding to this over here. And here we have to define what the type of value is. So this is really important because if I set this to a file, right, then I wouldn't actually be able to save the equivalent of this because this is not a file format, right? Like different bits of information are formatted differently. And that means that Bubble can do different things with them. It can manipulate them in different ways. So it's important that we define what type of value each of these fields actually is because the compartment size or the compartment shape is going to expect a certain type of value. So in this case, we want to set it to be obviously a text field. And you can see that there's obviously a whole range of things here. We've got a number one numeric range date. Um, we've got a yes, no, which if you've done some other programming in the past, you might be familiar with as a Boolean. So it's just basically a, a true or false equivalent field. And then some other stuff down here, file or an image, which will just be a link, a URL pointing to where that file or image actually lives, where it's stored on the internet, which may be in a database somewhere else. So that's our name field, okay? We wanna also create one for our price, and that's a number. And then we wanna create another one for, well, we'll call it the photo. Okay, and we're just dealing with a single photo for now. Obviously, your users might want to upload multiple photos, but for simplicity, we will just deal with a single photo for now. So that is adding that information now to our database. So now we have configured our product data type in the database. And now what we have to do is actually do the equivalent of, of actually getting the value from this input and storing it within a data type in our database. So that is some kind of behavior that our application has to do and all behavior that our application has to do, we're gonna define here in the workflow tab. Well, at least most of it, there's some stuff that you will define here on the design tab, but for stuff like this, we're actually kind of taking information from our page and storing it in the database. This is where we actually come to the workflow tab. So remembering that I've got this product button here, this add product button, okay? What I wanna do is add what Bubble calls an event, which is gonna be triggered whenever that button is clicked, okay? So I'll follow Bubble's instructions here and click here to add an event. And I'll come down to the element section and choose an element is clicked. And here I will now choose from the elements that I've defined on the page, and choose the one that I want to attach this workflow to. So of course, that will be the button add product. Now I've actually gone a long, a long way to setting this up. It's the slow way, a much faster way if I actually remove this, is from 
the element itself, if you have the element inspector open, you can just click start edit workflow. And that will just create that event for you. It'll just create a, this element was clicked workflow for you. Okay, so that's the event. Okay, so now when this button is clicked, this event will fire and we will now have to define what are all the things that will happen when this button is actually clicked. So those are called actions. So what we actually wanna do here is of course, create this new product in our database and save those fields to it. First section that we wanna add, we're gonna go down to data, things, okay? So this is sort of like the category of actions that you can choose from. And we are interested in data because we're saving stuff to the database. And then we're going to choose create a new thing. So in bubble speak, a thing is just an object that you're gonna now create and add to the database. So create a new thing. And now we're gonna choose what type of thing that we wanna create. And the option that we have here is a product. You would have noticed just by the way that when we actually defined our product here in the database, right? We already had a user data type here. And that is just a data type that comes out of the box with every bubble application, right? When you create a new application in your database, in your warehouse, there will already be a shelving unit defined for users. And that's because users are just so central to every web application that bubble has just incorporated some out of the box functionality to handle users. Um, that's what we're seeing here. But now that we're creating a new thing, right, we're going to choose from all of the non-user objects. If we were creating a new user, there would be a different action that we would actually choose. And um, it would be under account and then sign the user up. That would be the action we would choose. But we're gonna kind of ignore that for now. So now we're choosing the type of thing that we wanna create. So we already have that product template sitting in our database, right? Okay, so now we're creating a new product every time that this button is clicked, okay? So let's just see that in action. Like if I click over here and I add Nike shoes, $100, I'll upload those shoes again and click add product. Okay, well, we didn't see anything happen. And if you're watching that first sort of preamble section to this video, you will know that's because we didn't set any kind of alert or indicated to the user, but we have probably just executed this workflow. You know, we click the button. So in theory, this should have fired. And we can actually see if it did. We can go down to the data tab here. And if we go over to app data, this is basically gonna let us see all of the things, all of the objects that live in our database. So um, kind of need this to refresh for a second here and you can see, so all I had to do there was sort of click off of the products table or the products view and click back onto it. And now you can see here, we've actually got one object in our database, okay? This single row in this products table is corresponding to that button click that we just did. If I click this again, Ha ha, we've got a second object. You can see there's sort of a slight difference in their created date over here. So that's giving us a clue. But you can see the fields are all empty, right? Price is empty, name is empty, photo is empty. Um, I can actually click on this little edit icon to open up kind of the full view here. And indeed, you know, all of these fields are empty. You may be able to guess why. All we did was we created a new product. All right, so we did the equivalent of kind of taking an empty box, right? And putting it onto our products shelf. But we didn't put anything into that box. We didn't take any of these values and actually route them into this new product object in our database. That is what we actually have to do via the set another field option here. This is where we actually define what of those values should be saved into the object. So what I can do is I can add sort of the option to add a field here, and then I'm gonna choose from the list of available fields on our product object. So again, here's our product object, right? So I, what I have to choose from are those fields that I've defined already, those compartments that I've defined within this product box. Um, so I'll start with the name, okay? And it's gonna say name equals, okay? So that's a great clue, name equals. So now we're gonna say, well, what should that name value be set to, right? What should it be equal to? And I could just type in here, you know, my Nike shoes 2009. And if I reload our preview, it doesn't really matter what I type in here, right? In fact, just so that's clear, I might even type like Reebok shoes, okay? If I click add product now, and I look into our database, I'm seeing my Nike shoes. So I've just, to find some static value here 
that it doesn't matter what input has been typed into these inputs here, what value the user has defined, okay? The value of every product that I create is going to be my Nike Shoes 2009. So that's not obviously very useful, right? That's static information. What we wanna do is point this field to the input, okay? So point this field to the input so that no matter what the user types in, that's what's gonna be saved to the product. So that's what we call a dynamic connection, right? It's a dynamic value. The value in the product will change depending on what the user has typed into the input. Okay, so what I wanna do here, I can insert dynamic data here. I can first delete this and then click insert dynamic data and insert dynamic data. That is just the bread and butter of bubble. That is just like the magic kind of button. <laughs> uh, you click that and now you can write an expression, right? This is where you're actually doing programming. You're not writing code, but you're choosing options, okay? So the options that you have to choose from here are, um, well, lots of different things, but what we're interested in are these inputs here. So this is where it was useful that we named these inputs before because now we know exactly which ones they are. So we want to set the name value in our product to be equal to whatever value is in that name input in our application, okay, in our form. So input product name. And at the moment, okay, if I just click off of that, this red coloring here and this issue that we're seeing up the top here, this issue tracker, Okay, that's telling us that this is not a valid expression as it is. Okay, and the reason is we can't set this name text value to be equal to an input. It kind of like doesn't make sense, right? It's like trying to say that, you know, the price of my shoes is anger. I guess that makes sense on a kind of metaphorical level, but it wouldn't really make much sense if you're trying to go into the shop to buy some shoes and the price tag said anger. So this is kind of an invalid, an invalid thing. I mean, you might throw a tantrum and make it come true in the store, but what we want to actually do is is make it literal so that a machine like our, well, the program that is our application, which is just running on a machine, right, which is stupid, literally, it doesn't actually have any intelligence of its own. We have to tell it literally everything that it has to do. So we're not interested in the input itself. We're interested in what's inside of the input. And that's what we mean by value here. Take whatever is inside of that input, the value inside of that input. So that's what we're doing there. And then we're gonna do the equivalent for those other fields too, which is pretty self-explanatory. So the price is equal to the input products prices value. And then we'll do it for the image, right? So, or rather what's, we call it the photo. So the photo is equal to that picture uploader's value there. And so now in theory, this should be working. So let's try it out. Okay, let's say Nike Shoes 2010. I'm not even really a Nike Shoes guy, so I don't know what the brands are here. Let's say $150 to give it something a little different and I'll upload an image here. And then I'm gonna click add product. And we go now into the database, we should see, alas we do, an entry here in the database, which is corresponding to the values that we just typed into the form. All right, so we've got our content now being saved from that form into the database. A couple of little small UX things that we might wanna do at this point. Okay, if I go back down to workflow, Right here, I'm just gonna add another action here, which is reset inputs. And what that's gonna do is once we've clicked this add product button here, then all of the values of these inputs are just gonna be erased so that the inputs are empty again. And that reset relevant inputs, specifically the inputs that it's going to reset are the inputs in previous actions, the inputs referenced rather in previous actions. So these inputs here. So again, we're going to follow our best practices. We change one small thing. So now let's now test it. Okay, I'm gonna click add product and wham blam, there we go, um, those are reset. So we're getting some kind of visual indicator now, right? That stuff is happening. Um, and we might wanna go even one step further. This is, albeit an element that I almost never use, but for demonstration purposes, it's quite handy, is this alert, okay? So it's an alert which I can tick to position it at the top. It won't be visible when the page is loaded, but what we can do, is add another action here, which is going to show that alert. And we can set in milliseconds how long it's gonna kind of fade in and stay on the screen and then 
fade out. So if we reload the page, then we can see that in action. And what I actually want to do this time around, I'm just going to add my details here. T-shirt, $30. I'll just add my shoes again because it doesn't really matter at this point. I want to actually draw your attention to this bar down here, which is the debugger, which is if there's one thing more than anything else to take away from this video, it is use the debugger. The debugger is your best friend when things aren't going wrong. The debugger is the only person, the only entity, I should say, that you can really rely on. So one thing that we can do is we can go into step by step mode. And what this is going to do is that when I trigger an event, like clicking this add product button, okay, then it's going to let us cycle through each one of the actions that's going to be triggered by that event one by one. And we can see what's happening inside of each of those actions at the same time. So right now we're seeing, okay, that event, uh, that button add product rather is clicked. Okay, so now we're going to see what happens next. So we run next. Okay, it's going to do this action, create a new product. And you can see what the values actually are that's being set in that new product. And you can actually click into any of these sort of blue highlight here and you can see, okay, what's the expression? Okay, what bubble here is calling the evaluator. What's the expression that's actually leading to this value that's outputting this value. And this is the expression here. It's input product names value. And I can actually click there to see what is the value of that input at this precise moment. Okay, so you can do that for all of these. And this URL here, this is actually a URL on Bubble's own servers. So Bubble is actually hosted on AWS, Amazon cloud services. So Amazon's massive server warehouses that power a lot of the web, honestly. They power Bubble as well. That's at least where a lot of Bubble's um, storage lives and where your app storage lives. And so this is just a link. It's just a URL to a precise location on one of those servers. Okay, so when we uploaded that image here in this picture uploader, okay, that image was actually uploaded and saved to somewhere on Amazon's, or rather we should just call them somewhere on Bubbles servers. And this is the location here. So now this product, when it actually lives in the database, this photo field technically behind the scenes is just an address to a location on the server where the image file actually lives. And then every time that you want to display that photo, then basically your, your application is going to look at that address, find the photo, and then download it into your user's browser so that they can view it. But anyway, that we're getting into the weeds a little bit there. We're going to go run next now. We're going to see, okay, reset relevant inputs. That's the next step. If I click that, presumably the inputs have been reset now, as you can see. And then there's this last action here, show message in the alert pop up. So we're going to run that and you can see there's that alert beautiful at the top of the screen. So that's all, you know, this workflow is doing all that any workflow is doing rather. It's just a cascade of actions. A certain event happens and then in order, all of these actions that you define are going to trigger. <laughs> all right, so that's all good and well. We can now save data into our database, but Obviously, what we really want to do is retrieve that data from the database. So go into our application's memory and pull out some data to do something with it. In our case, to just display it. We just want to take information that one user has saved and display it out to another user. So just coming back to our trusty sketch pad here, we're basically just doing the reverse of what we already just did. So we've got the database here. Inside of our database, we have a shelf full of different products. And then we've got our application over here, right? Here's our app. And we basically want to now sort of take one of these items off of the shelf, okay? And save, display its information out on the page somewhere, okay? So the way that we actually will do that is by routing the values through some visual elements. So we'll basically have like a text element here that's going to display the value. We'll have another text element to display the number and then we'll have an image element to display the image so that what we can ultimately do right for any of these particular items here is just pull these values through onto the page. We need visual elements on the page as the conduits through which we can 
display information out in the database. So I'm just gonna jump into the bubble editor and just show you how that looks kind of in practice. So I'm going to, for this moment, I'm gonna go uh, hold down control and just select all of these guys here and just move them over to the left hand side. And we're actually able to group these as well, but I'm gonna get to that in a moment. Okay, and then just over here on the right, I want us to have some way of actually displaying this data back out to the database. So if I've just got a text field, this is you know the simplest thing that you could do here, okay? This text field, as you've seen before, can hold static values, right? So you could just type in here, exactly what you want it to display, or you could insert some dynamic data, okay? So dynamic data being data that's being, you're, you're looking somewhere else as to what the data should be displayed. And the main place that you're gonna look very often is going to be the database. So to get into the database, to basically, we're at the moment where we're talking about this text field here, for this text field to be able to pull out an item here, it basically, we basically need to tell it where to look, okay? We need to tell it, hey, come over here and look into the database and find this guy and then pull this guy out and display some of its value here, okay? So we're doing a, a request essentially to the database to retrieve some information. And the way that you program that in Bubble is with this do a search for action. So we're gonna do a search for, and that's saying look in the database for a particular thing. Okay, where do we wanna look? What shelf in the warehouse do we want to go to? Okay, we wanna to go to this one, the products. Okay, the product shelf. That's what we're looking for, okay? And now we can also add some constraints. We can say, okay, so what products should I look for? Okay, you could say things like, look, only look for products that were created within the last 24 hours, or only look for products that start with the letter D, or you know, any kind of search constraint like that. Only products that were created by a particular user. We'll kind of get into that kind of stuff in a little bit as well. For now, no search constraints. So this is just gonna look in the database and pull out all of the products that live there and then display them back out to the user. So we're gonna search for all products and immediately that's going to be an invalid expression because what's happening there is we're actually pulling out like all the products, right? And then we're trying to display them through a text element that doesn't really make sense. We just wanna take one of them, okay? We just want one single uh, item here. So for sake of clarity, we're just gonna grab the first item in that list, okay? So we're pulling out multiple. We wanna grab the first item in that list of things that was returned from the database, okay? And then we're saying, okay, well, what field on that object, okay? I'm gonna replace it here. Which of these fields do you actually wanna display in this text here? Because you can't display the whole product, okay? You've gotta choose what value you actually wanna display. So we're gonna choose the name. And just before we do this, okay, I wanna just make sure that we're cleaning up our database a little bit because we've got a couple entries here that don't have any names on them and that's gonna kind of ruin my demonstration here. So anyway, those are all our products here with some kind of random names. And I wanna add a, a sort by value here. So I actually wanna grab the most recently created item in, in the database. So we'll go, um, we'll sort by created date and then descending we will choose yes so that we're getting the most recent at the top. Honestly, this still confuses me whether it descending should be yes or no. So um, I hope that I've, that I've got it right here. Um, and there we go. So there's our first value, T-shirt. So that was the last value that we created. So if I was to add something else here, right? If I was to add basketball, I don't need to add the other fields. Uh, we're still on step-by-step -step mode, so I'll turn that off. And now basketball is being displayed, right? And we can use the debugger here as well to make sure that this is actually working as we expect. I can go down to this inspect button here, okay? And that's gonna let me choose any element on the screen. I can also search for them here. And if I click on it, it's just gonna pull up kind of all of the properties, all of the values and settings for a particular element. And anywhere that there's this blue kind of clickable text that's showing you that that's some dynamic information. So you can click into it to see what's the expression, right? What's the expression that's outputting this value? And the expression is indeed the search for products. And we're grabbing the, the first item in that list and then just displaying the name there. 
So you can see that that's working kind of as you would expect. All right, so now let's say that we want to display the price, right? So what I could do is I could control drag on this to create a duplicate and go first items kind of price. But this is a little bit of a, it's a non-convenient way of setting this up, writing this, exp this whole expression every time. We want to be a little bit more elegant. And so what I now want to introduce you to is the concept of a group, okay? So just going back to our sketch for a second again. Instead of grabbing one of these items and then individually writing an expression that's going to grab the text and then for this element it's going to grab the price and then for this image element it's going to grab the photo etc etc etc. What we want to do is instead just put all of the elements that are corresponding to the same thing in the database, right? All of these elements are gonna be displaying the same product. We wanna put them all into a group. So this is a group. And then instead of routing the value directly into a visual element like this text field, okay, we actually wanna pull the entire object, right? This entire product into the group itself. This whole group is actually holding an entire product. A group in Bubble is what's known as a container and containers can hold any type of value, just like an element, like, you know, just like a text element can hold text and a photo element can hold an image. A container can hold all of those things too, but it can also hold entire data objects. So if I just delete this, delete this, and come down here to this containers section and grab a group, right? Um, and then I'm just gonna format it in a way that where we can see it. So I'll give it a border. Okay, you can see up here that we can set the type of content. And that type of content could indeed be, you know, a text or a number. And there's, there's times where you'd wanna do that. But in our case, right, we can actually set it to hold a product. It's essentially a product shaped container. It can only hold products. And now we can tell it to actually look in the database, find a product, and then hold on to it for us when the page is loaded. So the data source for this product is going to be the same thing that we did for the text, do a search for a product, and we wanna make sure that we're doing that same sorting, right? And of course, this is now invalid because again, we're trying to grab multiple products here and put them into a group that's only programmed to hold a single product, okay? So we just have to grab the first item from that list or any item from that list, right? We also have access to the last item. We also have access to a random item or a particular item from a particular place in the list. Um, but we will just grab the first item. And now if we preview this, and we inspect our group here, well, you can see that it is in fact holding a product. It's holding the t-shirt product. And you can jump into the data source and see why. Okay, so that's all working perfectly. We have this t-shirt product living inside of the group. And all we wanna do now is basically like cut little slits into it essentially so that the values, the fields within it can kind of shine through, right? So that this stuff here, the text value for the name and the price and the image, basically create little windows in the group so that those values can shine through, can populate uh, the elements. So as before, we'll grab, for example, this text element, which is gonna hold the name and we'll insert dynamic data. And now we have access to the super handy expression, parent groups product. So parent group meaning the group that I am living inside of. And since we're writing this expression from the point of view of this text element, okay, the parent group is this group here, this group product. So we can grab the product that's living inside of that parent group and then we can display some value here and we're going to display the name and if i drag this down by holding down control now we can just update this to be price and i'll use an image element as well and instead of uploading a static image like we did it right in the beginning we'll insert dynamic data here for a dynamic image and again it's parent groups product and it's photo and alas, now our beautiful, absolutely wonderfully formatted group here that should win some design awards, in my opinion, is now displaying all of the values that we want it to. So this is working absolutely perfectly. And if we wanted to kind of change which 
values were being shown here, well, now we don't actually have to go in and edit every individual expression, right, and change the search parameters. We can just change it here at the group level. So maybe we want to actually sort these by um, when the first one was created. So show the, the, the earliest first. And our first one actually doesn't seem to have a price field or, or an image field. So that's why this information isn't showing up. But I think you get the picture. So we can kind of change the search parameters at the group level. And then all of the elements inside will, of course, reflect whatever the new value of the group is. And just while we're here, because we all pretty much always want to keep our elements in groups, okay, because it keeps the page organized and it makes it convenient for us to have groups reference other groups and pass information between groups, which we're not going to talk really about in this video, but good practice is to keep yourself organized here. So I'm just going to pause for a second and look in this elements tree and you'll see this is basically a list of all of the elements that are on our page right now and you can see we've got a bunch of elements here that are all existing kind of at the same level in the in the page hierarchy and then we've got our group product which we can open up and we can see okay here's all the stuff inside so we want to keep kind of a good level of organization here otherwise things will get messy really quickly so what I can do, I want to group these guys, the form elements within a single group. So if I hold down control and select all of these, what I can do is actually right click and then group elements. And depending on the structure of your responsive page, you'll want to choose a particular one of these. Okay, we're not going to go into responsive design. Um, today because it's not really worth doing when you're just getting a handle on the fundamentals of bubble but in our case we want to just put this inside of a fixed container so that's what it should look like with a fixed layout group all right so we've seen how to pull a single product into a container okay but what if we want to display like an entire list of products right so just like you know if you were going onto like the browse or the search page of this website you'd expect to see multiple products not just a single product okay so for that we need a different type of container right here we just have a standard group and a standard group can only hold one data object or one data thing at a time what we need is an object that can actually hold multiple what we need is something like this that this is sort of one formatting of it that has rows, okay, essentially like a table. And then when we look in our products shelf, when we look in the database and grab a number of different products, okay, well then we would basically pull a product into each of those rows, okay, so that we could display multiple of them to the user. So the way that we do that in bubble terms is with something called a repeating group which is very aptly named, okay? So a repeating group is just a group that repeats, or rather, more accurately, the right way to think about it is more like a collection of groups, all kind of stacked together or grouped together. At the repeating group level, just like for the group, we define what type of content it expects, right? So this is a kind of an ongoing theme, as you're adding elements and you're telling that element, you should expect this type of value okay whether that's like a primitive value like text or an integer value or a yes no value or an image or whether it's a data type value right like a shape that you've configured a, a, an object that you've configured like a product so we always have to define that it's just almost as if we're creating like a product shaped whole and it can only accept products right if you try to put you know a different object in there it just won't fit so we're expecting products and then the data source we can again do a search for products in the database and i won't add any constraints here and i won't even worry about sorting and this expression is now immediately blue because this is valid this repeating group is expecting multiple products and this expression right now is returning multiple products. When, when I say returning, what I mean is we're basically sending a request here to the database, do a search for products and send me back everything that you find. And so what is being sent back from the database is what is being returned. That's sort of like the lingo in the programming space, returned. So searching for products, we're getting multiple products returned. And if I preview this, 
Our repeating group is down here. We can't actually see anything in it yet. Okay, but if I sort of click on one of these cells, you can see, okay, well, inside this repeating group, okay, we're at the repeating group level here. Um, there's the first product, there's the second product, third, fourth. So there's, there's definitely stuff in here, okay? The only thing we haven't done, which you maybe have guessed already, is we haven't added any elements to actually display the values within these products, right? We haven't added the conduits through which these products can really show themselves. So we will do something here. We will add a big text field up the top. Maybe we'll give it a little bit of formatting here as well. And we'll insert some dynamic data. And now we have access to this expression current cells product. So in a repeating group, which is just like a table, right? Just like an Excel spreadsheet, essentially. Um, well, a single column Excel spreadsheet, you have cells. And those cells are just the, the subgroups, right, in the list. So current cells product. What we're gonna do is just define all of this at the first cell level here. So I drag this text element down, it's actually gonna be replicated in each of these cells. Right? Whatever I do up here is gonna appear in every single cell. So that's the really kind of convenient thing about the repeating group, is it just mimics the same formatting throughout each of the rows or each of the columns, depending on how your repeating group is set up. So when I choose current sales products name, you can see, well, this is sort of being mimicked across all of those groups. And then if I take a look at our preview here, you can see that is in fact how it is appearing. So this is sort of some really fundamental stuff here is displaying stuff in lists. And of course, right, we might want to also, maybe I will bring this over to this side a little bit and call this the price maybe make it a little smaller and bring that guy over. Actually, I'll bring him back and then add in an image here as well. An image here as well. Insert dynamic data, current sales products, photo. Okay, and there's our repeating group. This guy doesn't have a, a, a photo, but all the rest are displaying information just as we would expect. So that's repeating groups, that's lists in Bubble. All right, so we can now create and display these products, but what if we wanna let our users edit the products that they've created? That's kind of like completing the picture here is most applications, you know, let people add information, we display that information out, and we also let users edit and delete the information that they've added. So completing the picture here, we'd wanna let our users be able to edit products that they have created. So the way to do that, we basically want, you know, one way to do this is we've got this repeating group of products here. What would be cool is if we could click on one of those and that basically like displays a form from which we can actually edit the content. So we've already got a form here, which is convenient. What I want to do before we kind of get too ahead of ourselves, I'll create a new form which we'll use to edit one of these products. And then we'll actually combine that form, the edit product form with the create product form because they're using the same input inputs at the end of the day. We don't really need to repeat ourselves here. So we can use the same form for both creating a product and for editing a product. But let's just jump into an editing mindset first and editing form. Granted that we haven't really talked about users yet, um, but at the moment we're just gonna let like anybody edit any product, which is obviously not like a super intuitive user experience, but it's just gonna at least get us familiar with the edit functionality. So what I might do, I'm just sort of making this repeating group a little bit bigger to give ourselves a little bit more room, is just add a little button here. A little button that says edit, okay? And if we click that, then we basically wanna display a form that's gonna let us edit the product that's in this cell. And where we want this form to live, okay? We could have it live anywhere, but just to kind of show you a little bit more about what Bubble can do, okay? We're gonna use a pop-up, right? So a pop-up is a very special type of container that lives kind of one layer above your page and isn't visible to your users until you show it, okay? So we might call this the pop-up edit product. And just like any container, right? Just like we did with our first group now, and then we did with our repeating group. Okay, we need to set the type of content here for this 
pop up and because it needs to kind of house a product that we're then going to edit, we want to um, set this to be a product type of container. And we don't want to set the data source, okay? The reason why we don't want to set the data source is because we don't know yet which product we want to display in this pop-up. Setting the data source here is the equivalent of saying, when the page is loaded, what product do I want to load into this pop-up? But that's not the way that we're loading content. That's not the way that we're loading the product in this case. We're only loading the product when a user actually clicks on that edit button in one of the cells. And then we want to take the product from that cell and put it into the pop-up. So that's user behavior, right? That's a, a command that's going to happen when the user takes some action, okay? And that's a clue for us that we actually want to use a workflow rather than this data source. So we actually want to use a workflow here. And if I go back onto my page and click on my edit button, this is where we can actually program that initial event. So when this button edit is clicked, okay, we want to do a couple of things. Well, one of the things that we obviously want to do is display that pop-up. So if we come down to element actions, okay, and we click on show, and then what we want to show is that pop-up edit product, okay? That's kind of like one big piece that we need to do right out of the gate. So if I reload this and I click edit here, there our pop-up is appearing, okay? So the next step here is actually to put something into this product. So just jumping over, I wanna sketch this out again real quick. We've got our repeating group of products here, right? Repeating group, which I'm just gonna abbreviate to RG, repeating group of products, okay? with all of these individual rows. And in each of those, we have some different products, right? We have Nike shoes, we have a t-shirt, right? We have um, other stuff down here. We wanna be able to click on one of these cells and then populate, I might use a different color here. I'll use a green for the pop-up, okay? This is our pop-up. All we're doing is this. When one of these cells is clicked, or rather when the edit button in that cell is clicked, we want to take the value of that cell and push it into the pop-up. Okay, that's all I wanted to sketch. It's just really, really simple what we want to do here. So how do we do that in Bubble? What we'll do is before we show the pop-up, essentially, we want to display some data in it, okay? So that it's ready to go right off the bat. We want to program this action here. So how do we do this action here? Well, we want to add another action and I want it to be before this action. So what I'm going to do is right click and then click, choose insert an action. That's going to add an action previous to the one that I had right clicked on. And then we want to come down to element actions because what we're dealing with here is an element. And then we have the option here to display data. And what this is asking us is what is the element that we actually want to display this data inside of? Okay, that's what this first part here is. And we want to display it in this pop-up, pop-up edit product. And Bubble will know immediately that you need to display a product type thing in here. Okay, you can't just display any old data because the pop-up itself is expecting a product, right? So I couldn't, for example, I couldn't just use this, for example, current user. That doesn't make sense. And we're going to get this kind of error here where the pop-up edit products content type. So the type of content that it's expecting is a product. But what you're trying to put in there is a user. So anytime that you see these kind of like hints when you're learning Bubble in the beginning, it's just, just read them, pay heed to them. They're going to tell you what's actually going on and they'll give you an option here to, to resolve it by changing the content type of that pop-up to a user, but that's not what we, what we want. We want it to be a product, we just need to change our expression. So what we actually should be choosing is this current sales product. And by current cell, okay, this is referring to the cell in which the button was clicked, okay? So that's kind of a critical thing to point out is that any time that you're launching a workflow by clicking on an element, okay, you're going to be able to have access to the parent group of that element. And in this case, the parent group is the cell, it's the repeating group cell. So that button 
here's the button here, was clicked and it's inside of this cell. Okay, so we can actually take the value of that cell. So current sales product, current cell, again, from the point of view of the element that was clicked, which is the button in this case. And then we could actually choose a field here, but we don't want to because we want to display the entire product. We can take one of its fields later and display it through a text element. But for now, we will just want just ship the entire product into that pop up. And what I'll do just so that we can see this working right off the bat is grab a text element here and dynamically display that parent group's product, so the product in the pop-up, display its name. And now if I refresh the page, I click over here, Nike shoes, boom, there it is in the pop-up, Nike shoes or t-shirt, there we go, t-shirt is now in the pop-up, okay? So now we could just replicate this form, all right? I could literally just, if I delete this, I'm just gonna take this entire form here copy it with control C and then go into my pop-up edit product and paste it. And I want to actually make it horizontal. So I'm going to right click center horizontally. And then instead of adding this product, right? Because this is an edit pop-up after all. Okay, we should actually make this an edit product. So now what you would expect, of course, is that these inputs should be pre-populated to whatever that current product's values are, okay? So we can kind of see what was there and then change it. At the moment, right, even if we click this, and if I go inspect and look at this pop-up, yeah, it does have the product that we're expecting, okay? But we kind of want, I wanna see the current product's name in here. I wanna see Nike shoes. I wanna see the price, $100, right? I wanna see the image here so that I can change it. I can see it and then change it. So every input gives you the ability to display some initial content, okay? So when that input is loaded, is rendered, okay? What is the content that should just already be existing in there? When you're creating something from scratch, like we were with this original form here, you don't want to set the initial content, all right? We're creating something from scratch. It doesn't make sense to have an initial content in there. But now that we're editing something, okay, this is where initial content is really kind of critical for the user experience. So in here, I can insert some dynamic data. And what I'm actually seeing here is I can choose the parent group's thing. And to me, that's a clue, okay, parent group's thing. That means that the parent group doesn't actually have anything set. And in fact, Bubble is asking me to set it here. So this form that I carried across, right, which I might just call edit inputs for clarity, doesn't have a type of content itself, okay? So I could actually set this to be a product and then as the data source, I'm gonna choose the parent group's product. So remembering that this group edit inputs is inside of the pop-up, it is inheriting the product from that pop-up. And then these inputs can then pull through the value from the group. So just coming up to our diagram again, here's our pop-up, here's our edit group right? Here's our edit inputs group. So what's happening is the value of one of these cells in the repeating group is being pulled through into the, is being pushed rather into the pop-up via our workflow. And then this edit inputs is grabbing it from the pop-up level. And then any inputs actually inside of here are grabbing it from this edit inputs group. So we're just passing data from one group to another, from one container rather to another. All these repeating group or a group or a pop-up, they're all containers, right? They all hold data. And so um, what we need to be doing is playing past the parcel with one container to another and to maintain that sort of dynamic link in our logic. So this pop-up's having its value set by a workflow and then this edit inputs is just pulling that data from whatever the pop-up's value is, okay? So this is basically an expression that's just, you can think of it as running all the time. It's constantly looking here, okay, what's the value, what's the value, what's the value, what's the value? And if the value here changes, then the value inside of this group changes. So now that we have this parent group of the input set up, now inside of the input itself, we can have access to the parent group's product and then we can choose the value that we want. Okay, so 
in this case, the name, and I can do the same thing down here, the parent group's products price. And then I can do the same thing here with the photo. All right, and now if I click edit, boom, there we have it. All of that data is loaded and I can sort of just like, oh, you know what? I missed up the year, it was actually 2009, which in theory should make them even more uh, valuable, no? Uh, so that's all that set up. Now we have to set up a workflow to actually edit this stuff. Okay, what this edit product button should do. So let's go back, click on edit product, and this is where we're gonna choose start edit workflow so that we automatically attach a new event to this button. And have a little think here, maybe this is a good time to pause the video and just try and figure this out for yourself. If you've got this far, if you've been building along, just try and figure this next part out for yourself. What we're going to do, if you are, are ready to go, is come down to this data section because we wanna make changes to a product in the database. Our app is pulling out some product from the database and then it's making some changes to it and then it's sending it back in essence. So anytime that we're dealing with the database, we wanna be talking, uh, we wanna be using this data section and then we have op an option to make changes to a thing. So that's what we're gonna choose, make changes to a thing. And what's the thing that we want to, to change? The parent group's product, okay? So parent group, remember, this expression is from the point of view of the element that was clicked. The element that was clicked was this button edit product, which is living inside of this group edit inputs, okay? And that group edit inputs is housing the current product that we're looking to edit. So in theory, right, parent group's product is going to be that edit inputs group. So we're gonna get the product that we're trying to edit. That's, that is uh, what we want. And now we can choose, okay, what should we set all those fields to, right? What changes should we actually make? So we can set all these things to be, to be something new, right? Again, I could just type some new value here, okay? But obviously that's not what we want, it's not, Dynamic, we want dynamic data, not static data. So the answer here is just to point, in fact, we wanna point this to the inputs in our group edit pop-up. However, we haven't renamed our inputs here. So we actually have two edit product names. We've got an input product name here in the edit pop-up, and then on the page, we've got an input product name. So now that we're coming to do our workflow, input product name, input product name, which one is it? Okay, so this is a good example of why naming your elements is really important, really important. So pop-up edit product, we might wanna call this input edit product name, okay? Input edit product price, picture uploader edit, okay? Now, if we come back to our workflow, okay, we can actually see this is in fact the input that we wanna set it to. So setting the value there. So that when this button is now clicked, okay, it's gonna save the value of the input here to the product's name field. So that's the way that we edit stuff. So I'll do the same for the photo, right? Picture uploader, edit. And I'll do the same for the price. It doesn't matter what order you, you put these in, by the way. It'll all get executed by a bubble instantaneously, essentially. So we make changes to the product and then from a user experience point of view, right, we might want to then um, hide the pop-up, right? I'm gonna hide the pop-up edit product. And now let's see if this actually works. So I'm gonna click, I can choose 2009, right? I want them to be a bit more valuable. So rather they were 2010, now we want 2009. That's gonna bump up the price to $200. The photo, we'll, we'll keep the photo the same and then we'll click edit product. Okay, and you can see it changed. It changed here in the repeating group and it changed if you go into the database and you click refresh data down here, it changed here too, which is exactly what we would expect because this is where the data is kind of living actually in the database. And this repeating group here on the page is just retrieving the data from the database. Again, anytime that you are setting the data source, okay, like the search for products, just think of this as a command that is 
constantly being fired. So search for products, search for products, search for products, search for products. And if anything changes in what's returned from the search, then it will be reflected in the container doing the search or the element doing the search. So that's why we could kind of see it being updated here in real time. We didn't need to do a page refresh or anything of that nature. All right, I want us to start to do something a little bit more ambitious here, okay? We don't want to be doubling up here with this pop-up edit form, okay? And we also have a create form and they have exactly the same inputs. And this is violating something that we'll talk about a little bit more about later on, but is violating what we call the dry principle, the do not repeat yourself principle, which is a good principle to keep in mind when you're programming. If you repeat yourself, then you are increasing the chances of introducing some bugs into your code and you're also making it really hard to maintain your application over time. Um, that might sound a little abstract right now, but this will hopefully make it a little bit more concrete and more, the more examples that we that you see over time, um, you'll realize the value of this. So at the moment we're repeating ourselves. If we wanted to change the look of one of these inputs, right? Well, we do have styles, which we haven't talked about yet, but if we wanted to change something here, even change the, the placeholder here, you know, then we would have to change it also in the pop-up edit um, product form. So let's actually just use this single form for both editing and creating new products. How do we do that? Well, what I wanna do just right out of the gate is I'll just delete this form because it's not super important and drag up this repeating group. And now in essence, what we wanna do is when this edit button is clicked, right, instead of pushing the value of the cell into that pop-up, we push it into this form, okay? But you might be thinking, I mean, that form is, is for creating products, so kind of how do we make it do both? It is a little bit confusing the first time that you deal with this. Right, so the first step that we could do here just to kind of get our bearings, okay, is actually set this group, which we're gonna call the group add slash edit product, okay, and set it to be of type product, okay? Just like we did with the, the pop-up edit form. And this workflow here, we now want to change so that instead of displaying the data in the pop-up, we actually display it in that add edit product group instead. And we can remove this as well. And at this point, we could also set the initial content for these inputs, okay? And the reason that this is gonna work even for creating uh, a new product and editing is that unless this edit button is clicked, there isn't gonna be any value here in this group. It's gonna be empty. So we could easily set the initial content here to be the parent group's product's name, just like we were doing on their edit form, right? Parent group's product's price and the parent group's product's photo, okay? And if I load this, right, it'll actually look just the same as before, right? I might add here digital camera. I've just clicked tab there to go down to the next um, input, make it $400 and upload it here. And then I created a new product. Now it's not appearing here in my repeating group. Why? Well, if we come down to our repeating group, we see we've got a fixed number of rows. We're only showing four rows. So we don't want that actually. We want many different rows. And you can see that this minimal height of the row is actually giving us some issues here because this line here, um, you can see there's sort of a bit of a, a weird overlap. So we might just wanna make this a little bit bigger. 150 pixels would probably do it. And now if we preview the page, we're kind of giving some more space here and we can and we can scroll. So that's working great. We can see that we've created that digital camera. So this is still working, even though we set up that edit kind of functionality, this is still working. However, now let's see what happens if we click edit. Boom, now we've got a, a value in here and we could do this for any of these, right? Edit, edit, boom. So it works to create a new product, okay? And we can get a new product kind of in here, but now if I click add product, if we do the step by step, we're creating a new product. Again, another digital camera, and I only have one of them. So this is a problem because um, I can't sell two things of something I only have one of. <laughs> so if I refresh this data, 
in the database, you can see we've got two digital cameras. So this is a problem. We don't actually want to create a new product every single time that button is clicked. Sometimes we want to edit the product that's already in there. So let's just think about this for a second. We've got this form here, okay, with a button here, okay, and some inputs, right? Some inputs. Now, at the moment, when this button is clicked, we're launching this workflow, which is to create a new product. That's fine. We also want to launch a workflow where we edit a product, okay? And since we have the same element triggering two different things, okay, we need to have some conditional rules, right? We basically need to say the equivalent of if there is an existing product, right, in the form, right? If that's true, then we want this to fire. If it's not true, then we want this to fire. Okay, so in Bubble, how we would do that is I'm just going to delete my pop-up edit product because it's going to confuse things, is we've got the single event to add a product and we actually want to add another action here if I insert an action and that's going to be our make changes to a thing action and the thing that we want to make changes to is going to be parent group's product, okay? And we would set this up just as we did before, right? To be taking the value of those inputs, the inputs that the form is, is also using when it creates a new product, right? The price, okay. Okay, only now you can imagine, well, this is a problem because first it's gonna create a new product and then it's gonna make changes to a product if it's in the form and then it's going to do these things. These things are fine. These things are, are kind of what we want. However, we don't want both of these to fire. So what we actually want is an only when condition here. That's the equivalent of writing this rule or this conditional, uh, conditional rule here. So an only when rule. We only want a new product to be created only when that parent group's product, so the form, right, the, the container that's holding those inputs, when it is empty, is empty, okay? Because of course, on page load, right now it is empty, okay? There isn't anything in here. As soon as we click edit, well, I'll, I'll click inspect here and you can see for yourself, right? It's empty, there's no product in this container, it's empty, but once I click, click edit and we've pushed a value into that group, well now it's no longer empty. Now it has a product. So you can guess that the inverse condition is what we would want over here, right? Only when the parent group's product is not empty, okay? In that case, we actually wanna make changes to the product in that group. And the alert, the last kind of thing is the alert, is we can actually change the alert message here, you know, depending on whether a product was added or created. I'll get to that in a, in a minute, I think. Let's just test this functionality out for now. So let's just add a new product, for example, right? Maybe we've got a lawnmower to sell, $160. All right, there's our lawnmower. Okay, let's do the step-by-step. I'm gonna click add product, okay? That button add product is clicked, okay? Next step, create a new product, okay? We only want that to happen when the parent group's product is empty. So here's that condition, that only when condition, and since it's highlighted green, that's telling us that the condition is true, okay? The answer to that condition is yes. The parent group's product is in fact empty, is empty, is yes. Okay, so that's all great. And then if we run next, the next action, which is gonna make changes to the product, well, that's highlighted red because it's not true. There isn't any product in this form. Yes, there's values in the inputs themselves, right? But we haven't actually pushed a product into that underlying group, okay? Which we would have been doing by clicking this edit button. Okay, so this make changes is not gonna fire. And then reset out relevant inputs and show the message that is going to, um, to then fire. However, now if we come back to our Nike shoes 
And um, I've recently found out actually these are 2005, which is probably gonna double the price, at least to my logic, and we go step by step. Now, will we create a new product? No, we won't, because that parent group's product, right? The, the, the input form group, the container for all of these inputs, it has a product in it. Is empty is equal to no, right? There is a product inside of that container. So then we move over to the next action, which is evaluating to true because there is not, um, well, rather there is a product in that group. So is not empty is evaluating to yes, okay? And now you can see that we've made changes there. And so the last thing here is that is that alert that I've just showed you. So I actually click change the alert message. So we want this alert message to display something different depending on whether the, there was a product being created or whether um, we were editing a product. So we can use the same kind of only when logic. I'm actually gonna add in the, uh, the expression here. So parent group's product is empty, okay? And at the moment, this would just say yes. Like if I, if I just click add product here, okay? It's just evaluating to the value of that expression, which is yes. So what we actually wanna do, is we, if we come over here and go, formatted as text, we can actually give a value, a text value to be displayed if this expression is true, right? So if the product is empty and we can give another one if it's no, okay? So if it's empty in that case, right? We're saying that the product was created and if it's not empty, then we're saying that the product was edited. Okay, like I said, this is sort of like intermediate level bubbling here, but pretty simple to get your head around and, and can be a really, really powerful way of, of adding some nice UX to your site. So if I add a new product here, what's another product that I can think of? Maybe an iPad, you know, it's secondhand. So I know they're still pretty expensive. I'm gonna upload. Okay, and then if we click add product, boom, product created and Let's say I'm gonna edit my t-shirt, no one's buying it, so I'm gonna reduce the price a little bit. And let's run through this step by step. We already know what's gonna happen for these actions. And if we come over to our show alert, and we can see that the, the option is product edited because we had this, this formatted as text expression here where the, the parent group's product is not empty. And if we format that no as a larger text string, then what we're getting is product edited. So product edited is what we're gonna see up the top. All right, now our page is looking a little bit crammed. In most applications that you're gonna build, you're gonna have the concept of pages, right? You're gonna have different content that's living on different pages in your application. So let's do that right now. At the moment, we've just got this single index page but let's actually split off some of the content here. So we'll keep the index page as kind of like a home search page, right? Where we can just sort of like list all of the goods that people have listed for sale. And then we'll have sort of like a create a product page where we'll actually put this form here. So if I just go up to my page uh, drop down here, this is where you can add new pages. So I'll add a new page here and I will call it the create page. And I can actually choose one of my existing pages to duplicate, but in this case, we will just create a new page from scratch. Once we're on the page, okay, as before, because at the time I'm recording this, the new responsive engine is still in beta, I'll have to go in and upgrade the page to the new responsive engine. Not that that's making a whole bunch of difference for us right in this practice app because we're only dealing with a fixed width page, right? So our page is fixed width. So this is our new create page. And now I wanna go back to my index page and I actually just wanna bring this across. One way that you can do this is actually by going right click and copy with workflows. And what that's gonna do is it's not only gonna let us copy and paste this content, but any workflows attached to that group. So this add and slash edit uh, product group are also going to be moved over. So this is definitely gonna break our, our edit um, functionality, but that's okay. This is mainly for demonstration purposes. So fully okay with that. So I've copied with workflows that group and over here, I'm going to paste with workflows. Okay, so that's our add product page right there. 
And as usual, we should test that this is still working. So if I just add sort of another lawnmower, let's say, it's a cheaper model. And if I now add this, just check in my database, all products, cool, we've got another lawnmower. So that form is still working. What we also have is an issue that we've seen to have introduced. So anytime that you have any illogical statements in your application or anything that's kind of broken, Bubble will flag them to you. So right here, if I click on it, it'll take us to the element in question. It's saying that um, we can't actually show this alert product created anymore because actually we're on the create page now and that alert we didn't copy over from the index page. So I actually don't have the option here. So I'll just fix that by coming over back to our index page and I'll grab that alert and I'll actually cut it. So I'll control X on my keyboard, come over to the create page, paste it back in. You can see it's a different width there. That's because our index page is actually 1080 and the default width for our new create page is 960. So I'll just bump that up to 1080. Again, I don't want us to be dealing with responsiveness. If this was responsive, then we would make sure that no matter what the page size was, that these things would appear appropriately. But as I said, we're gonna deal with that in another video. So there's our product up the top. Um, and it looks like it's automatically reconnected itself right there. So the alert has just gone away. So that is awesome. And then over on our index page, we can actually delete this now and move this over here. And now this edit button has actually had that workflow attached to it um, edited. So that, that action that was going to be displaying data in that form pop-up uh, rather in that form group has now been removed. So let's just let's just remove that edit button for now because that's not the functionality that we're that we're looking to build. So now we have two pages in our application, right? Um, the logical thing that we want to do, allow our users to do rather, is to move between pages, right? So the most common user experience that we are all used to is having some kind of header, right? So I'm going to drag a group up here to act as my header. And I'm gonna just change the style to be a group border so it kind of sticks out a little bit. And what we can do is we can have some buttons up here that navigate the user to a particular page. So we might have a button here in the right hand side, which is called create a product. All right, create a product. And in this case, what we wanna happen is when this button is clicked, we wanna actually take the user from this index page and put them over onto the create page. So I'm gonna start edit workflow, add an action, and the action that we're actually looking for is under this navigation section. So anytime we're dealing with moving the users around through multiple pages, then we are talking about navigation and specifically this go to page action. So this is gonna let us choose where in fact we wanna send the user to. So I'll send them to the create page. These pages, by the way, this reset password and this 404 page are default pages that Bubble gives you out of the box. Resetting passwords is sort of, Bubble has some built-in functionality for doing that. That includes this reset password page. We're not gonna go into that today, but feel free to look up in the documentation how that works. And this 404 page, that's what will be displayed if your users try to go to a page that doesn't actually exist. They will end up on the 404 page, which maybe you've done in the past and your internet wanderings ended up on a 404 page, um, then you'll know what I'm talking about. So anyway, setting the destination to the create page, we can ignore all of this. This would become relevant if our page had a data type because pages themselves, okay, if I go to this create page and just double click here to open up the inspector on the page, pages themselves can have a type of content. So pages are just another container, just like we've got groups and repeating groups and pop-ups and got a couple of others here that we haven't talked about today. Um, pages also act like containers for data. Um, in our case, we don't, because the create page doesn't have a type of data, then um, we don't need to worry about the data that we are sending. We're just moving the user from one page to the other. So now if I go and preview this, 
Okay, here is our heater up on the top. In fact, I might just make it a different color just to stand out a little bit, maybe a sort of a dark blue like that. All right, now if I click create a product, here we are on the create page. So obviously we wanna do sort of the equivalent, right, on the create page. If I just extend my page height here a little bit, make it 800. Okay, and then I'll drag this form down a little bit to give us some room and center it horizontally. And now I could create a new header, right? I can go group and put a new header here. And pretty quickly, I'm feeling like this is a bit tedious actually, because, okay, well, let me make sure Right, I've got to set it to be the same color, um, same color, and then I want to get the button and I want to get it probably in exactly the same place because I want to look, I want it to look exactly like this. So isn't there a way, maybe I could just copy this, right? I could just copy this over. Um, let me see, okay, okay, I've just copied it over. Um, this is the creator product. I'd probably want, you know, another button to take the user back to the main product page. So I add a browse button, but now my first header on the index page, now this one is out of date, and now I need to create a button here. So what I'm trying to do here is set the scene for the need for what Bubble calls reusable elements. Elements that you create in one place, and then you can add them to multiple parts of your application. So you're basically creating like a master template that you can then uh, distribute throughout your application. So back to our trusty little sketchboard for just a moment. Pretty simple concept, reusable elements. So over here, we have our browse page, which in our app is called the index page, right? And over here, we have our create page. Now a reusable element is something that we're gonna define as if it was a page, okay? So we could have over here, our header, which is a reusable element, which we basically define as if it was a page. So it exists independent of any particular page. And now we can add this particular reusable element to any of our particular pages, but we're not really putting the original reusable element, we're just putting an instance of it. Okay, it's as if this is sort of the master template. So if I was to make changes, to that master template, like if I was to add a button here, then those changes would propagate through to all of the instances of the reusable element, okay? So in that way we can just make changes and maintain one element in one place and have those changes be reflected throughout our entire application. So that's all really a reusable element is super, super powerful concept. So how does it actually look? Well, let's jump into the bubble editor and actually create one ourselves. All right, I'm gonna delete this header that I just created and I'm going to come up to the page and add a new reusable element. So the reusable element is gonna be called a header. And I'm gonna create it from scratch here. Again, just like for pages, right, we need to do this upgrading to the new responsive engine, which you won't need to do if you're watching this after the new engine is out of beta. Okay, so here is our basic layout for our header. I wanna make sure that we're dealing with fixed width again, because I don't wanna worry about responsiveness. And I'm just gonna make this the same size as our canvas. And I probably only need to make this about, let's call it 80 pixels high. Okay, so this is our reusable element. And like before, I can change the color to be kind of like a dark blue and I'll add a button, which is gonna be create a product, right? And maybe I'll have a different type of button here. See what bubble offers me. Okay, that light one is probably cool. We probably wanna define our own button styles, our own button looks, but for now, this is, this is fine. Now, if I go to my index page, and I scroll down here, there's this section called reusable elements. And in fact, you can see there's two headers and that's because Bubble actually gives you a header out of the box. So this is my header, this one with the lowercase, which I should probably rename to, to Matt's header. Let's call it just so that we can differentiate. 
but um, yeah, Bubble just trying to help you out. It already has some predefined header formatting for you. This is how the Bubble one looks. So, you know, pretty nice right out of the box. It does what kind of we need it to do, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. Um, let's keep things slow and drag in our own header where we know kind of how it works. So we've got that header on the index page and now we can go over to the create page, delete this and add our header there as well. And now if you look on our create page, there is that header, it's a reusable element. So if I try to edit this, right, I can't, I actually have to click edit element or come over to it in this page tree here, open it up and now I can kind of change and edit this actual header. So just take note here, we've got this one button, create a product. If I control drag on this button to make a new one and call this browse, okay? And then I refresh my preview, you can see that now the header has been updated here as well. So these changes will propagate through to any instance of this reusable element anywhere that we've put it within our application. So then we can attach our actual uh, workflows to these buttons, right? So we've got a navigation action here, which is gonna say go to page. We'll go to the index page in this case for the browse button. And for our create a product, we're going to go to the create page, the create page. And this is now gonna let us have this way for our users to navigate from one page to the other. So we're on the create page, let's go to the browse page. We're on the browse page, let's go to the create a product page. So there you go, that is reusable elements in a nutshell. Pretty simple concept, but very, very powerful. Wherever you can, you want to be building in reusable elements. You wanna be building things in a modular way. That's gonna keep your application really clean and really what we would call maintainable. So it's gonna be easy for you to make changes later on because there isn't this kind of convoluted spider web of logic. You've created like this module that stands apart independent of everything else, right? I can define a header, define all the logic for the header within this run reusable element that I know works and then put that kind of all around my application. So I can kind of siphon that off as like a self-contained unit of logic, so to speak, that I know uh, it is working. All right, now I've avoided talking about users up until this point, but this is the right time to introduce them because users are such a central concept for every application that you're going to use virtually. I mean, you, there may be some applications that you're building where you don't have your users interact at all. It's just some backend um, tool that you are using. But nonetheless, they're sort of unavoidable in the bubble universe. And most of your applications are going to have some kind of user interactivity. So that's why bubble um, has them existing out of the box. So you have this user data type here. And um, one really cool thing about users is that any other data object that's created in your database is going to have this created by field here. And that created by field is gonna be populated by whatever user was logged into your application at the time that that product was created. So at long last, let's actually kind of get into the meat of this, okay? We want to have in our header, okay, I'm not gonna use the bubble predefined header because it's kind of cheating. Um, we wanna have kind of like a login button. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna drag these, move these buttons over a little bit and maybe make this one a different color, okay? And call this sign up or log in, okay? This is where we would, typically want to display, after clicking this button, display a sign up form or a login form to the user. And this is something that Bubble actually gives us out of the box as well. We've got the sign up login pop up here. I've got a bunch of handy logic kind of built in. Now you may have noticed it exists as a reusable element, right? The sign up login pop up is a reusable element. And I'm still in the header here. I'm still in my reusable header. So I've just copied one reusable element inside of another reusable element. And that's something that you can do too. You can nest reusable elements inside of one another. In our particular case, we're probably not gonna do something like this on our index page and put this 
sign up login pop up actually on this page, right? And then trigger it from the page, right? So I've got another sign up login button here, which if I go down to element actions and then show, I'm showing that new sign up login pop up. Boom, just like that. So I could do that, right? But it obviously in this particular case doesn't make a lot of sense to do that because, well, one, that sign up login button should live in the header. And also the fact that it lives in the header will allow us to launch the sign up login pop up from multiple pages, potentially. That's some a user experience that you might wanna have in your app. We actually wanna nest the sign up login reusable element inside of the header reusable element. And that means that we can always just trigger the sign up login reusable from within the header. And we don't have to trigger it independently from the pages themselves. So I'm gonna remove that, All right? And so what I wanna do here is just create that exact same workflow. So on clicking the sign up login button, what we wanna do is create an event, create an action rather, that shows that sign up login pop up. Just like that. And so what I want us to quickly do is just actually recreate the functionality of this sign up login pop up, just so we can actually see how it functions, okay? So if I remove this sign up login pop up completely and I just create a new pop-up on this page. So we're just gonna create it as a normal pop-up right now, not as a reusable element, okay? And I wanna make sure it's set to be fixed width. That's great. I might just extend the height a little bit. And let's just create two groups here, okay? One group is gonna be for where the user can sign up and the other group is gonna be for where the user can log in, okay? So the inputs are slightly different. So this group over here, I'm gonna do this in the most simple way possible. This group over here is gonna be our group sign up, okay? And that means we might wanna add some text to it, right? That just says sign up and give it some header formatting, okay? And I'm not gonna worry about labels right now. We're just gonna use the placeholder text as our labels. So we'll have an email input Okay, input email, where I'll actually set the content format here to be email. And what that's gonna mean is that we're actually not gonna let our users enter anything into this input that isn't formatted like an email address. Okay, it'll come up as invalid. All right, so there's our email input, and now I'm gonna control drag to grab a password input. And in fact, I might just center these both Sent to all of these rather horizontally. And so this is going to be our input password. And the placeholder is going to be password. And we can actually format this to be a password as well, which is going to mean that when the user types something in, then it's not going to show the user what they're typing, right? Just like you'd expect in a normal password input. It's just going to be a whole bunch of asterisk signs one after the other. So you see how that works in a moment. And then we'll have a button here, which is gonna be our sign up button. When this button is clicked, this is kind of where the magic needs to happen. So I'm gonna go start edit workflow. And since we're dealing with users now, user logic, um, we're gonna come over to the account page and choose this first section here, sign the user up. So what this is gonna do is it's gonna create a new user object in our database, right? Just like how we were creating products before, right? We had a product shape box that we were putting onto the shelf and putting some values into it. Same thing here, but for user objects, we go through this action here because users are a, a special kind of data type within Bubble with some special kind of features that only apply to users. And you can see what those features are under here, right? We have, you know, you can log users in and out, update their credentials, so their password. You can send them password reset emails. 
send a magic login link. And um, it's good that Bubble handles all of this stuff because you know a lot of this stuff is security sensitive. Password handling is, is a topic that we wouldn't really be able to handle ourselves in terms of the encryption of the passwords and this kind of thing. So it's very good that Bubble kind of takes care of that stuff for us and then just exposes the sort of one action that lets us change a user's password or logs a user in with a password. So, um, so we've got the sign the user up action and here we would just point these fields to the inputs where the user is entering in these values, right? Just like when we were creating the product. So input emails value and this one will be our input passwords value. And actually I've misspelled password here. So I'm gonna right click, shortcut tip here, right click on this input here, the expression and click reveal the element and that's gonna take me right to it in the editor and I can just change the name there. So signing the user up, we're not gonna require a password confirmation, okay? That would mean we're gonna have another password input, okay? So the user has to type the password into the first input and then type exactly the same password into the second input. I'm sure you're all familiar with that kind of um, feature. Um, we're gonna keep it simple and we're not gonna check remember the email either. So if you're unsure about what any of this stuff does, if you just hover over a lot of things in Bubble, you have this sort of C reference. Okay, so we can click on that and kind of say, okay, what does this mean to remember um, the email? And it's telling us that if we set that to be true, the user's browser will remember the email that they last entered when they went to sign up um, or log in. So that means if a user logged out and then logged back in, their email address would already be pre-populated. So, but we're not worried about that in this case either. So we're gonna sign the user up. And then the last thing that we might wanna do is actually just hide that pop-up, right? The user's logged in now. If I start typing up here, then I can filter the elements on my page. I'm gonna hide that pop-up, which is called pop-up A at the moment. We should probably call it pop-up sign up and log in. Let's just do this for now, okay? We've got some extra space down the bottom, which I'm gonna use for our login group functionality. And then we're gonna kind of show and hide these groups depending on what the user wants to do. But let's just test whether this functionality itself works. All right, I'm trying to click this button and nothing's happening. So I can go step by step and try to see, okay, what, what is meant to happen here? And doesn't look like I've got any action assigned. So thank you debugger, another good reason why we would use the debugger in this case. So what I actually have to attach here is an action to show that sign up login pop up that we created. So element ac actions show that pop up sign up login. Okay. There we are. And so I'm going to enter my email address here. A helpful tip if you want to, you know, you're testing login or sign up functionality or any kind of functionality really with a lot of different test user accounts. You can keep using your own email, which means that some random bugger on the internet isn't gonna get your test emails, um, but also means that you can continue to receive them in your email box. It's just by putting a plus and then putting kind of some value after the end, which might just be, you know, test, it might be a number, it might be kind of today's date in some way, whatever kind of makes sense for you. At least in the case of Gmail, it will ignore everything after this plus sign. This email address will still get routed to my email, matt at mattnary.co, but in Bubble, Bubble will see this entire email address. So it will pick up different users, even though all of those users' emails will still be routed to your real email address. So I'll do that here. Okay, and now we'll type some password in here and have the user sign up. Now, the user apparently has signed up at this stage. What we could do is kind of give some indicator in the header to show when the user is signed up. Okay, so maybe what we wanna do, right? Just a really simple thing is just add some text up here and we'll make sure that it's light text so it shows up and we can say logged in as, okay? And then we can add, I might actually make this even smaller, logged in as, and then insert dynamic data. And we wanna choose this option here, current user. So that will return whatever user is logged into the application at this moment. So the current user, and then we can grab any one of these fields from them. And what we're gonna do is grab 
the email. Because of course, the email is a default field that we have for all users. If you go into the database and click on the user, you can see that this email field is what Bubble's calling a built-in field. So it's default that comes out of the box. Um, every user is always going to have an email. Now, if we refresh this page, you can see, voila, I am in fact logged in. So that's awesome. So kind of the next logical step here, okay, we're still seeing the sign up logger and we wanna have our users be able to log back into the application, but it might make more sense for us for, to let our users log out and then we can kind of test that log in functionality after that. So what we could do here, right, if I just use hold down control and select both of these guys, Okay, and then hold down control and drag this button here and make it a bit smaller. I could make this a log out button and then I could attach my log out action to this button. So that's again under the account settings, we've got this action called log the user out. Okay, so that's again, some bubble built-in functionality. But that's not a very clean user experience, of course, to have one button for sign up and logging in and another button for logging out. Kind of makes sense that when the user isn't logged in, they see this button, sign up login. And when they are logged in, then they see this button, this logout. And so what we could do here is use what is called a conditional statement, right? Which is just like we were doing with our workflows when we were defining an only when statement here, we can define these statements at the element level as well, okay? So the element will actually be sort of constantly asking itself the question, is this true, is this true, is this true, is this true? And anytime that it is true, it'll take subsequent actions. So let's kind of see how that would work. If we come over to the sign up login, this is where we want our kind of first condition to live. I have the option here to go to this conditional tab and this is where you define all of those rules. And you can see this, this button already has one. It has a this button is hovered condition. And if we go to our preview, you can see in fact, it does have a slight hover behavior. You know, when I'm hovering over it, it's going dark. And that's actually a condition that's built into the style settings for this button, right? The style here, this primary button style. If I was to select off of this, then that condition becomes visible for us. So you can see that this is how it's defined, okay? We've got sort of an expression up here that says when this button is hovered, and then a series of button commands essentially telling this button what to do should this condition be true. And we actually wanna keep all that stuff, okay? So I'm actually gonna put us back on that primary button um, so settings, and then we're gonna define our new condition here. So I think what the easiest thing to do in these kind of situations where you have two different elements and you essentially want them to be visible or invisible based on some condition is to just make them both invisible by default and then define the condition that makes them visible. So the first step that we wanna do here is come over to this layout section and click the element is visible on page load. So we wanna untick that, okay? And that means that when the page is actually loaded, this element will not be visible at all. And that's a great starting point because now we can just define a condition to tell the button when it should be visible. And that's sort of a, a nice way of keeping behavior consistent when you have this kind of conditional show hide functionality. It's just set things to be invisible by default. And if you know that you've done that everywhere in your application, then you know you only have to look in the conditional tab to see in what condition should it be visible. So just the best practice there. All right, so here's where we're gonna define that condition. I'm gonna click this button here. The question that we wanna ask here if we're just think, sort of taking a step back, that's a good habit in bubble, just take a step back and just, and just ask yourself in plain English or whatever your native language is, what do I actually want this logic to do? So this button is invisible by default and we want it to be visible only when the user is logged out. Only when the user is not logged in do we wanna show this button. Let's see if bubble exposes an expression that captures that. I'll click here to start writing this expression and what we wanna do is choose the current user. So that's sort of at the start of this expression. What is the object? What is the thing that we're evaluating here? And thankfully for us, Bubble offers this is logged out expression, okay? So anytime that that's true, 
then we can set a number of properties on this button. And the first one that we want to choose is if this element is visible. So since our user's logged in at the moment, we're not kind of seeing this behavior, but um, we do still have our logged out action attached here, log the user out. So I'm just going to click that to log the user out. And then in theory, that sign up login button should become visible. There it is. Now it is visible. And if we inspect any of these elements, okay, it'll actually show us the conditions as well. And they'll be highlighted green whenever they are true. Okay, so the current user is logged out. So conditional behavior is super powerful. You'll be using this all the time in your bubble development. So we did also want to have sort of an equivalent action here on this logout button. So what if I actually drag it over the top of the other button? Okay, so they're kind of taking up the same space on the page. It's, we're giving it the illusion of it being a single button when in fact it is two separate buttons. And we could actually set this up to be a single button. Okay, we could actually set this up using some conditional workflows, right? To say, you know, if the user's logged in, then trigger this logout action and otherwise trigger the, the logged in action. Um, but, you know, we'll keep things simple right now and we'll just have two separate buttons here. So we want to do exactly the same thing here on this button logged out. We'll tick this element is visible on page load. No, okay, so the default behavior when the page is loaded is for this to be visible. And then we want to, when the current user is logged in, right, because we're got talking from the logged out button's point of view now, then we want to set this element to be visible. And if I click the sign up login button now, and let's just say I sign up as a different user, so test number two, right, and sign up. Now our logout button is appearing, and if I click that to log out, now I'm logged out, and that sign up login button is appearing. Okay, so we've got that basic um, infrastructure here set up within our header, but we still have some work to do in our pop-up sign up because at the moment we're only letting users sign up. We also want to let them log in. So I want to set this up the same way as this default bubble sign up, more or less, because it deals with something called custom states, which can be a little bit of a confusing concept um, in the beginning. Um, but it's worth introducing them early on and just getting uh, getting familiar with them because there's not that much to them um, and you will encounter them, you will use them within your bubble development. So um, this is a great place to introduce them. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna copy this group here, the sign up group, and I'm gonna make this group my login group, okay? And you might be wondering, well, why on earth are you doing that? Like, you're not gonna have two forms, one above the other, right? Like, that looks ridiculous. Um, and you'd be right, that would look ridiculous. What we actually want to do here is when one of these groups isn't visible, okay, then it actually collapses. So from the user's point of view, we're only gonna see one of these groups at a time, okay, because the other one is gonna disappear and because it's collapsed, okay, the size of this pop-up is gonna shrink to accommodate the group that is still visible. And so for that to work, we are going to just touch, just tinker around the edges of the responsive engine. I want this pop-up to not be a fixed layout, okay? I actually want it to be a column. And a column layout in Bubble is going to force any elements inside of it to be stacked on top of one another. Here's our column layout here, right? Column container, right? If we wanted to add a group into here, which we've done, we've got two groups here, they would automatically, as they have been here, kind of be stacked. This is group A, this is group B. They'll automatically be stacked one on top of the other. You can't kind of move them around um, in the way that we were seeing in the in the previous parts of this video. Whenever you're using uh, a container like column or like the one, other ones that we're not going to talk about today, align to parent and row, then any elements that are inside of a container with that setting are going to have their position automatically set depending on that container type. So in a column scenario, 
it's one above the other. I don't actually want this to be a responsive tutorial because there's a lot more to kind of discuss here around how this engine, this responsive engine is actually behaving. So even though I've set the layout here to be a container, I've actually still got a fixed width and a fixed height, okay? So that's why we've still got this, this space here on the right-hand side. The only thing that I might do is if I go into each one of these groups, I can set the alignment of this group relative to the, the parent group, right? So um, I'm gonna set this guy to actually be in the middle and set this guy to also be in the middle. Okay, with that little responsive setup out of the way now, what we do have on both of these groups, if we click on them, is this option here, collapse when hidden, okay? And that's gonna let us do what I was discussing before where we actually collapse the height of that group. If we collapse the height of this group here, right? If, if group A is visible, then basically group B will move up, okay? Group B will move up and the rest of this container will move with it. So only thing that we're sort of missing here is the ability to kind of switch between both of these groups, right? Depending on what the user wants to do. So what we could do, I'm gonna just extend the height of this pop-up just by maybe 60 pixels. And I'm going to have a button here, a button which I'm gonna make um, a different kind of look and I'm gonna make this my button, we'll call it switch. And how this works is gonna work is if the user is currently seeing the sign up form but they wanna log in, then they're going to click this button to see the login form instead, okay? So that's just basically exactly the same as the default sign up login pop up over here that Bubble has created works, okay? So that's what we're creating here. So on our pop up, right, first thing I might wanna do is make this horizontally aligned. Okay, so what we basically need here is like a rule that basically says like if the user is in sign up mode, okay, and they click this button, then switch them to login mode. And we also want the inverse condition. If they're in login mode, but they wanna go to sign up mode, okay, then this button will switch them into sign up mode. Okay, and a common way that this is done is using something called custom states. So I actually just wanna pull up a new test page here, okay, just to demonstrate this in kind of isolation so that you get the picture. A custom state is nothing more than another container, right? That's actually what it is. Like we've got a group here, right? And that is a container and a container holds a type of value. A custom state is exactly the same, okay? I could define a custom state on this group, right, by clicking here and going add a new custom state. And that custom state, I would set to be the same mode. And then I would set it to be a particular value. So it's sort of a container that lives on a container, okay? So if this is, in this example here, this is our group A, you can think of the custom state as almost like a meta container. Like it's not visible on the page, it's just a hidden container to hold some value, okay? And that can be really useful for a whole variety of different purposes. One of which is just holding some information such as, okay, which mode should the sign up login form be in right now? Should it be in the sign up mode or should it be in the login? mode, okay? And then depending on what that mode is, okay, other elements on the page can react, okay? It's almost like it's a traffic light, okay? So let's sort of just like demonstrate that. So I'm gonna delete this group and I'm gonna set the custom state here on the page level, okay? So you can do that. You can set a custom state on any element, okay? But to keep things organized, a good practice is to do it at the page level so you can find them easier later. And I'm gonna call this mode, okay? And we're gonna make it a text value, okay? And we can also set a default value here for the mode. I'm gonna get back to that in a second. Now, all I wanna do here, I'm gonna drag two shapes out onto the page. Let's call it a shape green, and we'll give it a green color. And I'm gonna do a shape red, okay? Traffic light colors here. 
Okay, now I want both of these guys to not be visible on page load, right? Just as before, but I wanna set some condition that's gonna say whether or not they should be visible, okay? So that condition, okay, is gonna be looking to the custom state. So if we just ignore this for a second, okay, we've got a custom state here, okay? We're gonna have a custom state here living on the page. And that custom state is either going to be green or it's going to be red, okay? Depending on what it is, if it's red, then we want the red shape to appear. If it's green, then we want the green shape to appear. That simple, okay? So the element, right, the equivalent of these groups here are looking to the custom state, right? They're looking to the custom state to know what they should do. And so in this case, right, the custom state is green, so the red one's gonna disappear. However, if that changes to red, then the green one is gonna disappear, okay? So these shapes, as before, like any condition, they're constantly asking themselves the question. In this case, what is the custom state value? What is the custom state value? What is the custom state value? So they're asking themselves that over and over and over again. And anytime it's gonna, it's gonna change, then their behavior is gonna change. Okay, so in practice, that means setting a condition here, which to get to the custom state, we're first going to select the page. Okay, so the page name is custom state. Okay, and in fact, I'll just name it to be custom state page. So it's super, super clear. So we're first going custom state page, and now we have access to this mode option. Okay, so that is referring to the custom state living on the page. Okay, so the pages mode, right? When the pages mode, when the value in that mode cu custom state, right? The custom state that we've called mode, when that is equal to green, okay? Then this element is visible. And we'll have the inverse over here, okay? So just as a little shortcut, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna right click and copy this expression, come over to the red guy, and paste it, okay? And what I can actually do, um, that's one little shortcut. What I can also do is just copy the entire condition, right? So very, very um, quick way of, of, of changing these things. And then I'll just change this to be red. What I need now is a way to change the state of the page itself, right? So change whether or not it's gonna be green or red. And so I might, have a button here which says red and another button over here which says green okay and this is where I actually need to set the action which changes the custom state so when button green is clicked we want to because we're dealing with an element here right the page is in a way just another element we're going to set the state. So change the value inside of our custom state. So the element that we wanna change is the custom state page and then custom state itself, right? Because you can have multiple custom states on an element. In this case, we've only got one called mode. And now it's saying, okay, what do you want the value to be called? What do you want the value to be set to? So we want it to be green. And then we create an equivalent for red. So I'm gonna copy this workflow and paste it and now I'm just gonna change this to be button red, okay? So the element that's clicked to launch this workflow, button red, and then the value here is going to be red, okay? So let's test that out in action. Okay, so at the moment there's no value, right? When the page is loaded, there's no default value in that custom state. You can have one, but we didn't set one, okay? And let's do this step by step. If I click green, we're going to set the state, which is called mode, the custom state mode to be set to green. And there's the green one visible. If we choose red, now the red one's visible. So green, red, green, red. Now, maybe you're asking yourself, well, why did you not just use a, a show action, right? Just like show that shape green in this case. It's a good question. Um, the answer is that it is um, a very hard to maintain way of doing this because every time that you show the shape green, okay, you also need to hide 
the shape red. Okay, so there's now two actions where before there was just one. And plus, these shapes might be not the only elements that need to react to the custom state. For example, we've got two buttons here, right? But we could just as easily have one and we could have a similar kind of condition here. You know, it essentially says when the custom state pages mode is equal to one of those values, right? Is equal to green, right? Maybe we just, maybe we just actually set this, set it to red. And then if I copy this condition and paste it, then we would do an opposite one for red, okay? Now we have this button switch, okay? Reacting to the custom state. It's looking to the custom state to decide what to do based on some conditional statements, but also these shapes are. And we can't change the color of a button like this using workflows. We can't do it. So we're forced to use these conditional tabs, which are reactive by nature. Okay, they're always looking to see if some condition is true to decide what they should do. And so that's where the value of a custom state comes in. It's holding some temporary value, okay, which is um, usually going to be used, well, is often used to tell other elements on the page what to do. But it, you could also use it for all kinds of different things. You could have a product shaped custom state that holds a product. Um, temporarily, right? Maybe it's just like, you know, in, in a card in the, in the header. Um, so you're saving that as a custom state. The important thing about custom states, by the way, is that um, when the user refreshes the page, they're lost. Just like any other value that's on the page, right? We're not storing stuff in the database. It's just so stored locally. So a page refresh will, will undo it. So if I just preview this, so by default, we actually don't have uh, a value here. Um, I hope you're following along so far. Um, this page as it is set up right now is actually broken because I deleted one of those buttons earlier. Remember I had two buttons up here and now I've only got one button. And that one button that's remaining was the button that was setting the custom state to be red. So we actually want this button to be dual purpose, right? So if the custom state is green, then what the action that we want to fire is changing it to red. And if it's red, then the action that we want to fire is setting it to green. Okay, so another only when condition is necessary here. Now, I'm going to set this up what might be to you the intuitive way first off the bat, at least it was for me. And then you're going to see why that way actually doesn't work. So first thing that you think you might want to do, okay, button switch is clicked. Okay, we only want this action to fire right if the value of that custom state is green. Okay, so we could say only when custom state page, right, to access this custom state again, when the mode is green, then we set that value to be red. And then if I copy this expression, okay, then we basically just create the inverse here, right, green only when it's red. And at the moment, none of these will fire if we reload the page here, okay, and click this, nothing happens. And that's because there's no default custom state set at the moment. At the moment, the custom state for the page, this mode custom state is empty, it doesn't have any value. So that's why this is evaluating to false, okay, because the mode of the custom state page is empty and the same for the next one. So to resolve that, we can set a default custom state. So I'm double clicking to open up the inspector at the page level, and then I'm gonna set the default value to be green. And that should resolve this, right? So now it's green. And so now if we click red, hmm, nothing is happening. So this is a good time to check out our debugger. Maybe our, by using the debugger, we can figure out what's going on. So I'm going to go into step-by-step -step mode and just see, okay, exactly where is this workflow breaking down? So I'm clicking on red, okay. And okay, since we are in the green mode, right? The mode is green. We're going to set the custom state to be red. That's what this first action is doing. Okay, so that's all good. That's working. Um, and then in the next action, we're asking if the value is red, then set it back to green. So you can see what's happening there is we're just going from one 
state quickly to the other one. Um, this first action is setting it to be red, and then the second action is setting it back to be green. And so when you look at this in real time, it looks like nothing's happening. So how do we resolve this? Well, we don't want to have two actions back to back like this because actions, as I said before, they cascade. So one fires and then the next fires and then the next fires. And we don't want that. We basically want when the button is clicked at that point, we want it to ask itself, like, is it green? In that case, launch this workflow. And if it's red, then launch this workflow. So those are those are two kind of independent branches of logic, so to speak. We actually want two events here. And anytime that you have two events, they'll both fire. If a button is clicked, if I copy this, right, and paste this, okay, anytime that the button is clicked, both of these events will fire. So we want one of these to be the equivalent of the red, okay, so I'm going to cut this and paste it. Well, I can just delete this over here. Okay, so one of these is saying set the value to be green. And one of these is saying set the value to be red. Okay, so, so far so good. Okay, so now we've got, so we've got two separate events. Okay, and we've got an only when action in each. Okay, but this is still going to lead to an issue. And maybe you can kind of have a guess as to why. Let's debug this. And one way that we can do this a little bit more easily is actually rename our events. It's going to help us keep track of what's happening in the debugger. So, um, so this action here is setting the value to be red. So we want to call this event switch to red. And then logic states that this one, which is setting the value to be green, we should call set to be green. So all I'm doing there is clicking up the top of the event and then just typing in something new, okay? So that's gonna help us keep track of what's happening if we go step by step in the debugger. So let's do that. Step by step, I'm gonna click there. Okay, so this switch to red event is now firing. So this guy over here, and if we go run next, what it's doing, okay, it's looking, is the custom state green? Okay, which it is. In that case, switch to red, okay? And now the next event is firing. This guy, okay? So both of these events are set to trigger when the button is clicked and they're just gonna happen one after the other, which was kind of the problem that we had before, right? When we had actions. So you can probably guess what's gonna happen here. This is evaluating to see whether the state is red, which it is because we just changed it to red in the previous workflow. Um, so now we're just jumping straight back. So this is not working the way that we've set this up. To get this to actually work, we don't want to have the only when conditions here on the action level. We want them to happen on the event level. So we're actually going to sort of stem the flow right at the beginning. Essentially means is that rather than this event firing and then checking if this is true, and then this event firing and checking if this is true, only one of these events is going to fire because only one of them is going to be true. So what I mean by that is if I copy this expression here, I'm actually going to clear it out and put it up at the event level. So here I've got the event selected rather than the action, the event selected, and then I paste it in. Okay, this event will only fire at all if this condition is true. Okay, otherwise this will not happen. And same thing over here, I'm going to copy this, right click, and then clear it, and then paste that expression at the event level. You can see now that only one of these conditions is actually going to fire at a time. It's either going to be red or it's going to be green at any at any particular time. So in practice, right, if I click this now, switch to green, this guy is the action that we're firing now. Okay, that's only going to fire if the custom state is red, which it's not. At this moment, the custom state is green. Okay, so we're gonna skip past this event and we're gonna go to the next one. And that next event, right, this one here, is then asking, okay, is the custom state green, which it is? In that case, you're gonna set the value to be red. So that looks like the behavior that we want. And it's gonna work in the reverse as well. Okay, so we're asking, that switch to red condition now, 
Okay, so this is something that Bubble is kind of doing intelligently as it's changing which order of things to do these events in. It's choosing the one that's going to be false first so that we don't have the same problem that we had before. So now that switch to red action is being asked and it's false. So then we're moving over to the switch to green action, which is evaluating to true, in which case we switch back to green. So now this behavior is kind of working. Hopefully that kind of gets your head around the concept of using custom states as kind of like a routing mechanism here. You could just as easily, instead of using a custom state, you could use a group. Okay, you could use a group as the container for this temporary value. So you could have the type of content, you could have group mode instead, right? And as the type of content, choose a text, and here you would define what the default is. So you would it would be green. Now you point everything to this group rather than the custom state. So over here where you have these conditions, instead of custom states mode is green, you would go group modes text is green. Okay. And you would do that for, for all of these. You would you would change this to refer to group mode and then all of your conditions we'll be looking at group mode as well. And so that would work exactly the same way. The only value of doing it in a custom state is that it's kind of hidden, okay? This group here, you have to decide kind of what to do with it. Often people will put this in a pop-up to kind of hide it if they're doing it this way. And custom states do have some other benefits as well in terms of passing data between reusable elements and pages, but um, that's a little bit more advanced. We're not gonna kind of get into that today. So hopefully based off of this, you have an idea conceptually of what's going on that we can now apply to our sign up login pop up, right? So if we go back to our header element and our pop up sign up login, okay, now we can just apply exactly the same logic structure that we were doing on that test traffic light page to this, right? We want to set a custom state that's going to define whether or not either this sign up group should be visible or this login group is visible. Okay, so let's take this one step at a time. Let's first deal with the setting of the custom state and then let's deal with the elements that are going to react to whatever the value of that custom state actually is. So first, let's actually define the custom state, all right, which makes sense to do that in the pop-up. Okay, you could also do it at the header level because we're dealing with behavior that's only happening within the pop-up it's logical to also do it at the pop-up level. So that custom state, we can just call it mode again and make it a text value. And the default value, let's make that sign up. And then let's actually configure this button to start with, okay? And then we can at least make sure that we're setting the custom state appropriately. So when that button switch is clicked, okay, we actually want two versions of this. So I'll set up one first and then make a copy of it to do the inverse. So when that button switch is clicked, okay, let's make this our login logic. So we only want this to fire when the mode is equal to sign up, right? Because we want this to actually switch it to the login mode. So the inverse of sign up. And then we'll add an action here, which sets the custom state of that pop-up, right? Which sets that mode custom state to be login, right? And we'll rename this as well so that um, it's clear what the action is actually doing. And then I'll just make a copy of this. I'll make a copy of this event, okay? And this one will be switch to sign up. And here we just want it to do exactly the inverse. So set this to be login, okay? And set the value here to be sign up, right? So in this case, only when the value is login, then we want it to do the inverse, which is set the state to be sign up. So without dealing with um, what's gonna happen um, when this button is clicked, we can at least just see kind of if it's working. So first things first, let's inspect the pop-up and just see, okay, what's the custom state right now? And it's sign up. Okay, so that makes sense that it's sign up because that's the default value, remember? At the pop-up level, we defined this default value to be sign up. Okay, so that's working. So we can at least tick that off. 
Now, if we go step by step and we switch modes, okay, well, the mode is not login, okay, so this event is not going to fire. It is sign up, so this event is going to fire. And what that event is doing is setting the value to be login. So now, if we were to inspect the pop up again, we should see, there we go, that the value of that custom state is login. And if we were to click this again, then we should see that it is back to sign up. Okay, so we can tick that kind of bit off of setting the custom state. Okay, we know that functionality is working. This is a good practice is build things in a modular way, right? So this part of the feature is working. Now we can move on to the next part, which is actually getting these groups to react to whatever the custom state actually is. Okay, so we'll start with the sign up group here first. Right, so let's define the condition to start with. So this condition is basically saying, it's the equivalent of the traffic light system, right? Like when the value is green, then show me, okay? In this case, when the value is sign up, then show me. The custom state that we're looking for is of course living on the pop-up, right? So the, when the pop-ups mode is equal to sign up, right? Then show me, then this element is visible. Okay, and if we copy this condition and go over to our login group, we can just paste it and then quickly change things to be the inverse, All right? Login is what we're after. And then we can just test this too, right? Testing things in a modular way. We don't always have to set things up kind of in a complicated way, okay? Now, both of these elements are visible by default at the moment, okay? So we wanna change that to begin with. So on both of these, I want to untick this element is visible on page load. So that will at least let us see if it, they're, they're basically reacting to the, to the state. So at the moment, the sign up form is, is visible and that makes sense, right? Because the default value, as we showed before, of this uh, custom state in the pop up is sign up. And then if we go to switch modes, voila, we're seeing login. Okay, so that's working perfectly. The only thing, of course, is that we want this pop-up to kind of contract to the size of these groups here. So to do that, if we come back over here, we actually want to tick collapse when hidden. Okay, on both of these, collapse when hidden. Okay, for this to work, there's kind of one last step that we need to do, because at the moment, if we just, if we um, preview the page again, you'll see that, yeah, it's collapsed, right? They're both appearing in the same place at the top, but we've got all this extra space down the bottom and all that extra space is there because of the size of this pop-up that we created, but also because um, we've got a minimum height value here set. I set that earlier for kind of like ease of teaching this, but we actually don't want to have a minimum height here, okay? That's basically saying like this pop-up can be 660 pixels or higher, but it cannot be less than 660 pixels. So at the moment, this is 660 pixels high. So this is as far into the responsive design as we're gonna, as we're gonna go. I'm actually gonna set this to be zero. And so in our editor here, okay, we're seeing a completely collapsed signup form, but don't fret, okay. In reality, that's not gonna be the case when we preview because we're always gonna have a custom state here. So here we go. This sign up form is visible. It's asking us to switch modes, which we can do. And we could get a little bit fancy here as well. We could get some more space below this switch mode. I'm not gonna get into that in this video because we're gonna get too deep into responsive design in that case. The one thing that we don't have set up here, okay, we've got a sign up button that's signing the user up, but we haven't configured our login button, okay? So I'm because I can't see these groups anymore, I'm actually gonna use the elements tree to find them. So group login, button sign up. In fact, it's not a button sign up anymore. It's a button login, login. And now we can create a new workflow here to kind of finish off this whole process. The action that you want predictably is under account and it is to log the user in. Okay, and now we want to choose what input we wanna point this towards. And as earlier, we've got duplicates here, 
And that's because we copied the form, but we didn't change the labels, change the names of the inputs within those forms. Right, so if we go back to our group login here, we want to probably call this input email login and input password login. And then we could do the inverse on group sign up. Input email sign up and input password sign up so that we can keep track of what we're doing with these inputs a lot easier. Okay, so now we'll set this to be input email login, right? Which we know is the input living on the login section, right? So if I just untick this for a second, right? It's the this input here and this input here, okay? Not the equivalent inputs in the sign up form. So I'll just undo this so that it's collapsed again. And then the password is going to be the input password login value. Now stay logged in. Again, that's something that we can have a look at the reference and see what does it actually mean, stay logged in. And Bubble is telling us that's gonna keep the user logged in after 24 hours. So if that's not, if we set that to be no, then if the user's still logged in, they've logged into the app and then they've gone away or they've closed their browser or whatever and 24 hours have passed, then the app will automatically log them out unless this value is set to, to yes. So now we should be able to switch modes and we should be able to log in, right, using one of those emails that we already created. And there we go. Now we're logged in as that user that we created before. And of course we could do some other things here, right? Like we haven't hidden the pop-up here, so we'd probably wanna, we'd probably want to hide this pop-up sign up login. And we probably also wanna reset the inputs, okay? But uh, I think you get the picture, right? That's kind of how this works. So, so if I log this out again, There we are. Now we're kind of getting some nice user behavior. So all of what we just kind of set up is more or less the functionality that comes in this default sign up login pop-up. There's some more stuff here which you can dig into like having a forgot password functionality, but that basic functionality about switching between the sign up view and the login view, that is exactly how the, the bubble default form works. So now you can go off and you can create your very own sign up form um, based on that same logic. Mm -hmm. All right, so there's one last feature that I want us to create here, and that is the ability for our users to favorite or to like certain products, which then add them to a sort of a separate list, a favorite products list. That's gonna allow us to demonstrate absolutely fundamental part of Bubble, which is linking data objects, okay? So we wanna create a link between users and products in some way. Now, right off of the bat, I wanna draw your attention to our app data here, where you can see that all of these products that we created before have a created by field equal to that mat plus test user. If you remember, we weren't actually logged in when we created all of these these products, but what Bubble does is anytime, and I mentioned this earlier, anytime that I, an object is created in the database, okay, this created by field is populated with whatever user was logged in at that time. Now in our case, we didn't have any users at the time that where these products were created, but what Bubble was doing behind the scenes was remembering, okay, that all of these were created with my browser. And then the first time that I logged in as a user with this browser, okay, it automatically made this attribution. It just guessed that, hey, you weren't logged in before, but you created all these products. Now that you've logged in, I'm just gonna assume that it's the same user. And um, if you're interested, you can actually turn off that functionality by disabling how Bubble handles cookies, browser cookies. So look that up in the, in the reference, but that's essentially why, that's the explanation as to why we have a created by field here. If I was to log out and log in as our other user, our test2, and if I was to create a new product here, Right, and then we were to look in the database. Okay, you could see actually, so this latest product here was created by a different 
user. So that's how that created by field works. It's automatically populated by bubble. So that's sort of our first data connection. It's built in by bubble, but it creates a connection between one data object, the user, and another data object, the product, okay? And that can be really, really useful, okay? Because then we could do things like, if I had another repeating group over here, okay? And this was a repeating group of products, okay? I could do something like doing a search, right? Again, it's doing a search for all the products, but now I can add a search constraint. So a filter on that list that's only gonna return some entries. So one of the constraints that I could put on here would be that the created by the field that corresponds to a user is equal to the current user, all right? And now I'm only going to see, if I just add a text here and, sit and make that the current sales product's name so we can actually see what's going on. And if I go onto the browse page, you can see that that second repeating group only has one entry and that is the one that I just created. There's only one product created by the current user. So it's appearing over here. But we can also create our own connections between data types, okay? Not just by relying on the default created by field, we could create a connection between products and carts or products and courier companies, right? Or, or products and categories or products and all kinds of different things. This is not gonna be a deep dive into different types of data structures, but just wanna get you kind of familiar with the idea that we can do this. In our case, we're gonna just, we're gonna stick with users and products, but we're gonna create a different data connection between them, right? To allow this kind of favorite products list. Okay, so how this is gonna actually have to kind of work. So we've got a user here, right? That's the common rendition of a user. And they've got some fields, right? Like, well, they've got an email field. Okay, that's kind of like a default field that they have. But what we also want them to have, which is equal to, you know, some value. But we also want them to have, and I'm gonna use the UK spelling here, sorry guys, a favorited products field. How this data connection works is you remember that we have a shelf of products in our database, right? A table of products, okay? So one of these might be the headphones that we just created, another one might be the shoes, um, the t-shirt, all that kind of stuff, okay? And we essentially want them all to be stored, or the ones that a user has favorited, right? Let's say they favorited the headphones and they favorited the t-shirt and they favorited um, the shoes, we want them to be saved to the user, okay, in some way. And then we can actually kind of access them later via the user. Now, what we're not doing is we're not actually literally storing the products in the user data time, okay? Like they still exist on their shelf. All we're doing is creating a reference, okay? We've got a list of favorite products here, okay, which all these really are, are addresses. It's saying, you know, I want you to, you favorited that one and you favorited maybe that one, right? And I should really do this in another color and maybe you favorited that one, okay? And so these are addresses. It's basically, where is it on the shelf? Like if you, you know, you go to the library and there's like a code system, you know, Dewey Decimal system, and it's telling you like this book is in this, part of the library. It's on this shelf, you know, and it's this far down and it's sort of roughly this far across. It's the same thing here. It's just an address. It's basically saying that it's on shelf A in the position four or something like that. Behind the scenes, what's really happening is we're actually storing the unique identifier for each of these products, which is kind of, you know, without going too deeply into that, every single object that's created in your database has a unique ID created by Bubble. Okay, so this is sort of the equivalent of that address. This is how you can create a connection between a user and a product is by storing the unique ID of the product on the user. And in that way, okay, you can always find that product later on based on its unique ID, okay? Because then you know where in the database to look, right? On which shelf you should go to find that particular product. The key kind of takeaway here is that these products exist independently in the database, right? All right, here's our users. 
They, they're on their user's shelf. The products exist on their product shelf. But for any particular object, like for any particular user, okay, they might store references to other objects that let us find those objects later on. So in the case of our product, what we also have, if I just cut this over here, we also have a created by field, right? Which if we've got our users over here, okay, it's not literally storing a user over here, okay? It's storing a reference to a user. It's storing this long kind of string that's saying, this is the user that created me. So if you wanna find that user, then just look them up on their shelf, okay? Look them up by that unique ID. How do we actually set this up in Bubble, right? Well, let's get into it. So we first need to make changes to our data structure to accommodate this. Okay, so on our user data type, we need to create this field here, this favorited products field, okay? So I'll create a new field and we'll call it favorite products. And the type here is going to be of type product. Okay, but it's not a single product. If it was just one single product, okay, then this is all we would do. If the user could only select one product to be their favorite, then we would just leave it like this. But we actually wanna store a list of products, right? It's multiple products, it's multiple IDs here, right? Multiple of these guys. And so that's why we have to tick this field is a list. And then we can create that. And now it's just a matter of creating some logic in our Bubble application that's going to take certain products and store them on the user, or technically speaking, store the reference, the address of those products on the user. So just before we do this, I, I wanna store the email address of the user who created this product in this repeating group. And we can ostensibly say that that's so that other users can contact them about the products that they're selling. So I wanna insert dynamic data here. What I wanna do is, cause I've got, I've got a current cell that's a product, okay? I'm kind of, I'm grabbing the derivative fields from that product. What I basically wanna do is I wanna open up the product, this product here, and then I wanna pull out this created by field to grab the user. So I'm gonna go, current sales product creator. So just like I was choosing the name and the photo and stuff before, I can also choose the creator and that's returning an entire user. Okay, at this point, I've got an entire user that I'm dealing with in this expression. So this whole thing here, but of course I can't expose an entire user through a text element because a user, just like any object in your database, is it just a collection of fields Right, it's a package of data in different formats, text format, image format, number format, whatever, okay? So now I need to choose, okay, which of these fields on the user do I actually wanna propagate through this text element? And so I can choose the email like that. Okay, and since it's not appearing, I'm kind of curious as to why. So I'm clicking on my text element here current sales product created by is empty. Okay, it's empty. If we come over here to the creator, we're getting a hint here. So this is something you're gonna bump up to in the beginning. So we need to call it out and that's privacy rules. So a quick note about privacy rules. Here's some products in your database. Here's your app. Okay, so this is database again, if you remember this diagram. So inside of our database, we have all kinds of different data like these products. And what our application is essentially doing is asking the database to send data back to it, right? Our application doesn't have any memory, that's where the database comes in. So this kind of expression of grabbing, you know, this repeating group of products, what that's essentially doing is the application asking the database, okay, to return a certain, amount of products, right, to return these guys. So they all come running on their merry way and then are displayed out to the user in the application. The problem with this approach, when a object is returned, like a single product like this, all of the fields on this product are also returned, all of them. And 
that might cause a security issue, okay? Because you may not want all of these fields to be exposed to the user. With just a little bit of programming skill, okay, you can access all of these fields. Even if you're not actually displaying them in your application, you can go into the, in the inspect tab of your browser and you can pull out all of the fields that I returned here. And so that we need to deal with privacy rules because privacy rules are going to restrict sensitive data from being returned. Okay, so let's say that we were sending this product. We didn't want to send the, uh, the price. Let's say that was sensitive information. We could have a privacy rule that says, unless the user is say the creator of this product, then send everything to the application, send all of this except the price. So essentially acts like a filter at this point where price in this case would be left behind but name, image, you know, and the created by field, those would all be returned on the other side. So in a nutshell, really short um, consideration of this topic, that's what privacy rules are doing. And it's important that we deal with them because out of the box, okay, Bubble is, is setting some privacy rules on the user, okay? So even though we're getting everything from the product, okay, the user, that we're trying to get some information from is having its email restricted. And so if we go into the data tab and then we go to privacy, okay, this is where we can actually see what privacy rules we have set. And you can see we've got one rule up here, which is that when the user who is who you're evaluating in the expression is the current user, so in this case, Right, it would be, this would be like, if the creator of this product is the current user, then you would show their email, okay? So if the current user, the currently logged in user is the same user as the one that you're evaluating, that you're asking the question about, then this is what will happen. This is what you'll allow to happen. And one of them is to view all fields. Otherwise, okay, everybody else, so if you're not the creator of a product in this example, okay, then you can't actually see any information about any other users. That's what this is saying here. And so what we actually do want is to expose this email field. Okay, so that says that don't show anything else about a user, but you are able to return this email field for a user. Like that is something that can pass through this filter. I'm quite happy for you to pass through the email of any user, okay? And you might wanna you have some more elaborate privacy rules around where you can send these emails. And probably in your application, you might wanna actually have some kind of in-app chat or messaging functionality so that you never expose users' emails to one another. But in this really simple example application that we're building, this is gonna be fine. So now that I have updated that, I'll refresh the page. And now indeed you can see we are seeing those email addresses, okay? We are seeing all of these email addresses. So with that out of the way, okay, and privacy rules can get quite complex. So this is a really simple treatment of privacy rules. Let's get into our favoriting products functionality. Okay, so the first thing we've got to decide is how is a user going to add a product to their favorite products list, okay? And one thing that we might want to do is add a little icon, a little, icon here and we might want to make this like a little plus icon and let's customize this a little bit okay let's kind of make it slightly like like grayed out and then when it is hovered okay so let's add a condition here when this icon is hovered okay then we'll make it kind of a darker a darker color Something like this, there we go. And, you know, maybe we wanna make this a style. So we haven't talked about styles yet, but based on what we've set here, the values that we've set here, we can create a new style. So let's call this our hover icon, let's say. And now from the styles tab, okay, we actually can edit all of the values for any styles that we've created. So if I filter this by icons, you can see here is the, the style that I just created. And so anytime, like if I have another one of these icons over here 
and I set it to be the hover icon, right? Any time that I change something about this, let's say I give it a border, that's going to apply to all instances of that style. Any icon that has that style is gonna get that same formatting. So it's kind of like a reusable element in a way, you know, where you set the you set what the master template looks like and you make changes only to that master template, but you can have many different instances of the template all around your application and they will all reflect any changes that you make to that master template. So that's styles in a nutshell. I'm gonna undo that border. And what we wanna do here is attach a workflow now to this icon, which is going to take the current cells product, right? The product that's in the cell where this icon is, okay? And add that product to our user's favorite products, okay? Add one of these guys to the favorite products list. So we will go start and edit workflow. What we wanna do we actually have two options here. We can make changes to the current user. That's sort of something that Bubble gives us out of the box. So we can make changes to the current user who's logged in, or we could make changes to a thing. And the thing that we decide we're gonna change, we could choose make changes to lots of different things, is gonna be the current user. Now, what do we wanna change here? We're talking about what field do we wanna change, right? And we've got this favorite products field. Okay, these are the two fields that we can make changes to on our user. So we wanna choose favorite products. Now, okay, we actually want, because we're dealing with a list, we have some different options here. What we wanna do is add an item to that list. And the item that we wanna add is gonna be the current sales product, right? the cell in which this icon was clicked. So if I just go step by step for a moment and I go Nike shoes, okay, make changes to the user and we're adding that current sales product to the user. Maybe I'll add a t-shirt and I'll add a digital camera as well. And now if we look in the database, okay, and we evaluate our user, you'll see that there's a bunch of long uh, number strings in here, okay? These are the unique IDs of these products that we added, right? Remember I said, like all we're storing on the user is the address where we can find those products on the products table, on the products shelf, okay? So that's what we're doing. We're storing the ID here. So these are all of the addresses or the unique IDs of the products that we've added. Okay, and we probably wanna give some kind of indicator that these items have been added, okay? Um, so then we come back to our trusty conditional tab. Okay, so now we can do something really clever. We can say something like, okay, well, when the, um, the current user's favorite products, okay, we're taking that list and we're now kind of, we wanna ask it, you know, is the product in this cell that we're evaluating, is it inside of this list is inside of my favorite products list. So we can choose contains current sales product. So does the favorite products list on me as the user, okay, does it contain this particular product, the product inside of this particular cell? So that question is gonna be asked for each cell. Every single icon in every single cell is gonna ask itself this statement, okay? So that means that some of these icons will have the statement evaluate to true, and for some of them, it will be false, right? For the ones that do have a favorite product in the user's favorite products list, it will be true. So now we could say, okay, well maybe, maybe we say the element isn't clickable and the icon color, like again, we'll make it kind of a dark, a dark blue. Right, and now you can see, okay, so this item is in my favorite products list, so is this one, and so is this one, okay? So that's how we can kind of add items. And just to kind of round out this picture, what if we allowed users to remove items as well? How do we do that? Well, let's bring it all together now, the things that we've learned in this video, okay? We know that we want the behavior of this icon to be different depending on whether a certain condition is true. Namely, depending on whether the favorite products list has this product, this particular product in the cell in it or not. 
So we probably know that we're going to have to use some kind of only when condition here, right? So for the one that we are click that we already have set up, okay, we basically want to say like only if the product isn't already in the list, okay, then add it into the list. Okay, so only when, okay, the current user's favorite products doesn't contain the current sales product, then launch this workflow. But we also want the inverse, okay, if it is in the list, then remove it. If it's in here, okay, and I click the button, then remove it, or at least delete the reference to that product from my list of favorite products. So I'll just copy this and change this expression here so that it's when the favorite products list contains the current sales product, okay? And then we have to update this as well because now we don't wanna add the product. I can click on this by the way and then that allows me to change it. Now we wanna remove the product. So we've got two workflows here that are both doing the inverse of one another. And so if I click this now, in fact, I'm not able to, and if we go into our debugger, we might be able to get a clue as to why. Ha, huh. so this condition, which is saying, if this product, the product in the cell is in my favorite products list, then it's not clickable, okay? So the fact that it's not clickable means that we can't launch any workflows off of it. That's what not clickable means. So I should actually remove that condition. And now, if I click this, see how it's been removed. It's no longer blue. And if I click it again, it's added. So kind of at whim, I now have a ability to add and remove items from my favorite products list. All right, that is the end of this huge mega tutorial. We've packed so much in, so well done if you've made it this far. There's obviously a ton that we haven't been able to cover here because Bubble is this really complex tool. There's lots of layers to it, but hopefully you've got a, a good solid initial foundation now to sort of go out there and start exploring different avenues. Do let me know what you are building. I wanna know what challenges that you're facing. Um, let me know if this video was helpful one of the next big things that you should focus on learning would be responsive design. So I'll link to a video up here somewhere where you can um, get a good grasp on responsive design as well. Otherwise, best of luck with your building and happy bubbling.